Madam Chair, it looks like the numbers are beginning to level off. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. In that case, let's begin. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Urban. I'm the chairperson of the board for the California Privacy Protection Agency, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board. It's May 15th, 2023 at 9.04 a.m. As usual, I have some logistical announcements before we begin with the substance of the meeting. Uh, first, everyone, please check to make sure your microphone is muted when you're not speaking. That's largely for those of us um, on the panel. Additionally, for everyone, please note that this meeting is being recorded. Today's meeting will be run according to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as required by law. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by board members. We also have a designated time on the agenda for public comment. Today, that is agenda item number nine. I will also ask for public comment on each specific agenda item, and each speaker will be limited to three uh, minutes per agenda item for public comments. If you wish to speak on an item and you are using the Zoom webinar, please use the raise your hand function, which is in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you wish to speak on an item and you are joining by phone, please press star nine on your phone to show the moderator that you are raising your hand. That's star nine if you wanna jot that down. Our moderator will call your name when it is your turn um, and request that you unmute yourself for comment at that time. Uh, if you're using the webinar, you can use the unmute button. And if you're dialing by phone, you can press star six to unmute. When your comment is completed, our moderator will mute you. Uh, if you choose to make a public comment, it is helpful if you identify yourself, but this is entirely voluntary. You can also input a pseudonym when you log into the Zoom meeting. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is our intent to ask for public comment prior to the board voting on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please let us know by using the raise your hand function and the moderator will recognize you and you will then have three minutes to speak. Relatedly, I would like to remind everyone of some of the rules of the road under Bagley Keene. Both board members and members of the public may discuss agendized items only. This means that if you are speaking on an agenda item, both board members and members of the public must contain their comments to that agenda item. Items not on the agenda can be suggested for discussion at future meetings when the board takes up the agenda item designated for that purpose. It's number 10 today. Please note that we will take breaks as needed and also that our board member, uh, Mr. Vincent Lay has been delayed and is planning to join us in a bit. Um, accordingly, we may take agenda items out of order today um, more than we usually do. So please, um, please be aware of that. My many thanks to all of the board members for their service and to everyone who's working to make this meeting possible. I'd like to thank the team supporting us today specifically, Mr. Brian Souble, who's acting as our meeting council, um, Mr. Ashkan Sotani, who is here in his capacity as our executive director, and several of our deputy directors and council who will be presenting today. Thank you all and good morning. Um, I would also like to thank you, thank and welcome our moderator, Mr. Kevin Sabo. Good morning, Mr. Sabo. And um, ask you now to please conduct the roll call. Board member De La Torre. Aye. Uh, De La Torre present. Board member Lay. Board member McTaggart. Here. McTaggart present. Chair Urban. Present. Urban present. Madam Chair, you have three presents and one absence. Thank you, Mr. Sabo. Um, with three members of a five-person board, the board has established a quorum. Um, I'd like to know, uh, like, excuse me, I'd like to let uh, other board members know that we'll take a roll call vote on any action items. Um, agenda item two is an update from the chairperson. Um, I actually have no updates of my own. Um, uh, my updates are largely encompassed under number three, the strategic planning update. So we can go ahead and skip that agenda item today. Um, and I will recall it in a future meeting um, if needed. 
Uh, so with that, let's move to agenda item number three, which is a an update on strategic planning from Ms. Vaughn Chidambira, who's our Deputy Director of Administration. And I'm very excited to say that for once, I won't just be saying we're waiting for the contract. <laughs> Ms. Chidambira, please go ahead. Good morning. I'm happy to report the strategic plan development contract was awarded and executed on April 26. A strategic plan is a roadmap that defines who we are as an agency, including our vision and mission. It will list specific actions that we'll embark on to achieve our goals. The vendor for this contract was selected through the standard state bidding process. The selected vendor, Sorello Solutions LLC, is a certified small business in the state of California. Their consultants have over 20 years experience leading strategic plan development in addition to the other consulting services that Sorella offers. Our specific consultant will be working with CPPA as first experience working with seed agencies. Some of the departments they've worked with include Toxic Substance Control, Department of Aging, Department of Healthcare Access and Information, and the Gambling Control Commission. Our contract term is for one year and we have an option to extend if necessary. Some agencies can take longer than a year. Staff met with the vendor shortly after the contract was executed for a kickoff meeting. We shared some resources with the vendor to help them familiarize with our agency, including our statute. Information on our statute is captured in the statute, so this will help them um, understand our mission before we begin the process. The contractor is currently working on developing the process on how best to proceed um, bearing in mind some considerations that are unique to our agency. For example, we are governed by the board, which is subject to Bagley Keen, and this can affect scheduling as well as data collection. Um, the vendor is refining their typical standard planning process and will make sure that they take our considerations before our next meeting. We expect to have more information on the strategic planning process at our next board meeting and possibly a presentation by the vendor themselves in July. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Chidambira. Uh, questions, comments from Ms. De La Torre and Mr. McTiger. Ms. De La Torre, please go ahead. You're on mute, Ms. De La Torre. Apologies. Yes, I was wondering if um, we could have some information on the experience of this vendor with the topic that we regulate, which will be data um, privacy, um, gover data governance. Do they have any experience in that space? Not that I'm aware of, but we can find out and report back. We didn't get into the specifics of um, privacy regulations or the topic in general. The, the guidance, it will be on strategic planning. So we'll Staff will be giving the um, information on privacy space and they'll be leading with the development process of the strategic plan. So we will tell them what we want and they'll shape the process for us. Oh, okay, so I apologize because I'm, you know, I haven't served on board before so I'm not very familiar with the process. Um, so will the board have a conversation about priorities and then that conversation will be you know, the, this agency will be present there. I mean, how do we, the board, communicate the priorities to this agency or um, contractor? So. Yes, the board will be leading the process and you will have meetings with the vendor. But we are, since our first meeting, we are working with them and council to make sure that we have the appropriate guidance to guide the communication, bearing in mind that some of the meetings will need to be in the public and they just, there are more nuances to how the process will work but the board will be leading the process and setting the vision and mission. Um, Ms. Chidambira, would you mind saying again, the agencies, the example agencies that they'd worked with? As I recall, it was a, I don't remember all of them that you said, but it sounded like it was a real range of subject matter. They are quite a wide range. Um, one of them is the Gambling Control Commission. There's Department of Healthcare Access and Information. Department of Aging, and Department of Toxic Substance Control. And these are only the ones that the specific consultant we're working with has worked with before. Sorello has worked with other state agencies as well. 
I only listed the ones that our consultant will be that, that, that she has worked with. Okay, yes. So um, I had heard from that, Ms. De La Torre, that the consultants are able to do strategic planning with um, lots of different subject matter focused agencies that, that their job is, is sort of the process. I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is when we, the board, are going to have a conversation. I mean, I understand that they will help translate it into steps and actions, but I imagine that we, the board, have to have an item in the calendar at some point where we have that conversation, or is it like we're individually going to have the conversation with the consultants? That's where I'm a little confused. I thought that we had to have a conversation as a board in an open meeting, but maybe I'm confused. I think that is the plan, yes, Ms. I mean, yep. it would need to be, yes. Yes, that is one of the considerate considerations. It is part of the plan that the board will have a meeting, all board members together with the consultant. The consultant will also gather information from staff and that information will be presented to the board. So when the board comes up with the mission statement, it will have input from staff as well as, and, and maybe some stakeholders so when you decide what your mission, what the mission statement for CPPA it was going to be by you, I'm referring to the board, you will have enough information to take into consideration as you make the final mission statement. And how the consultant is going to gather that information is what they're currently working with, with guidance from council to make sure that they are compliant with Bagley Keen. And if we're going to have public meetings, what is the most efficient way to do it? And to ensure that we do meet, um, the timeline that they are trying to put out and will be presented in July. Uh, one last question. So from the agencies that they have worked with, are they also boards like our agency and they are subject to banking? So they are familiar with that or is, that, is this new for them? Um, from what I gather, they have worked with boards. In our discussions, when mm -hmm. Begley King was brought up, it seemed they had some experience, but we didn't get into specific details for how exactly they did it for the other agencies. So that'll be one of the discussion points when we meet with them again. We're expecting another meeting in two weeks with a vendor before they come to the board. Okay, uh, thank Mr. you. Geiger? Yeah, it kind of, uh, so, so what's, what's the deliverable here? Uh, is it a strategic plan just around communications? Is it a strategic plan around the, what's, what's the deliverable here? The deliverable is a strategic plan that will include our vision statement, our mission, our goals, and um, the strategies that we'll take to achieve those goals. Typically the timeline for the strategic plan is typically for goals that we aim to achieve within three to four years, but the timeline will be up to the board for you to decide. I'm imagining it may be goals for the next three years. And how, what, how much are we paying for this? We're paying, um, I have a number with me. We're paying 118,448. Uh, I, I, just as background, uh, because um, remember last time I was not here, so I think a year and a half ago I asked, when are we, the board, going to have a conversation on the priorities of the agency in terms of enforcement, in terms of the mission of the agency that's outlined um, on the law, obviously there's different um, items and which ones we're gonna prioritize. And that conversation has not happened, but I think I understand this contract as it was necessary before we, before we the board even can put it on the agenda to have the conversation. So that's why I was trying to um, better understand the process and what to expect. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Yes, um, Mr. McTaggart, for your for your background, um, the board um, was discussing the possibility of strategic planning, more formal strategic planning, uh, starting almost at our inception. I would say um, Mr. Thompson and Mr. Lay um, both had um, repeated um, thoughts about that. Um, I'm I'm certainly supportive. Um, and as we got our package, feel, our rulemaking package fielded uh, last summer, um, I turned to working to develop a plan to do the strategic plan. Um, agencies generally work with a vendor for that. Um, it has taken this long um, to get a vendor and the contract in place. And I really want to 
make sure to pause and thank Ms. Chidambira for uh, all of her work on this, because I know it's been a very, very long process um, with the state contracting process and um, finding a vendor uh, so that we can so that we can get started with this. I think Ms. Um, Chidambira, it'll be really important for the vendors, and I'm sure they're on top of this, but that it will be very important for the vendors to understand that a lot of our mission, if not all of it, is defined um, very carefully in our statute. And so we can start, you know, from that basis um, right away. Absolutely. And we did share that with them. And um, to address Mr. Latore's question on the priorities, that is some of the information you'll be communicating with a vendor and they will include that information in the strategic plan. So your priorities will then shape the goals and strategies for what we aim to achieve in the next few years. Thank you. Yes, Mr. McTaggart. So just to, uh, on your, kind of to your most, most recent point, uh, uh, it, it does feel like the roadmap for what the agency is supposed to do is kind of laid out in the statute. And so I'm just kind of wondering what our, you know, uh, we're going to spend a lot of money here on something. And I'm just kind of wondering what, uh, is it really just going to be uh, whether you should enforce or, or issue regulations? I mean, I, I, I kind of feel like there's not, like, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, given how it sort of seems like we know what we need to do right here, we, we, and we just, you know, we've done a massive step forward with the regulations and we need to keep on improving them and begin enforcement. But is what, what, what's the nuance of what we're expecting? And like, what, what is this going to tell us that we don't know already? I guess my question. Sure. It's going to simplify for the public as well as for staff what exactly our priorities are going to be. So it'll spell it out for the next three years. The statute is, is very broad, there's a lot of information involved. But through the strategic plan, the board will refine it for staff and make it clear what our objectives are. And from those objectives, we can develop KPIs for how we're measuring our progress. It is a state requirement for agencies to have strategic plans. And most state departments, when you go on their website, you'll see that they have a strategic plan on there. We don't have one yet. So we're, we're meeting that requirement. And then you're also helping us as staff to understand what exactly we need to prioritize and when. Thank you, Ms. Chidambira. Thanks. I didn't I, know what the state requirement. Thank you. Yeah, I have a, a related question. So um, we don't need to wait longer to actually have the conversation as a board in like next meeting about you know what our priorities for enforcement might be. I mean, I think that we need to actually, as a board, look at the list that is outlined in the statute and, and think about what what we feel should be. Um, coming first. Um, it's been a while since we were created and we're gonna start enforcing in a couple of months. Um, Ms. De La Troy, I would suggest bringing that up in the agenda item for future agenda items. Um, I don't disagree. I mean, I think the strategic plan is is more of a, is a strategic planning it feels more corporate to me than what I'm familiar with. Um, but my understanding is that it is it is a little bit more broad brush than that. For example, we are having our uh, biannual, semi-annual, I can never, I don't know which, twice a year, um, we're having one of our twice a year conversations about uh, rulemaking priorities. And that's much more detailed um, and uh, less of a, of a general trajectory over the next um, few years. Uh, so I, those things are not, I think, intention. Okay, I appreciate the effort of the agency in getting the mechanics going on so that all of this can be formalized. And I uh, look forward, this, I think we need to have a conversation as a board to say that we're, um, what we think should come first so that the um, contractor can include that in their processes and the processes of the agency. So I'll add that uh, 
the chairman, uh, chairwoman's suggestion at the end of the meeting as a potential. I, I'm, it, I apologize, it's a little confusing for me because like I said, I don't have experience in other boards. And when I suggested it, what I expected is that we will just put it on the agenda and have a conversation and let the agency decide on the implementation process. But um, I, I think we're getting close, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Uh, further comments or questions, or shall I call for public comment? I'll just kind of echoing if, if it's okay, um, uh, Ms. Del Torre's comment. I, you know, I wasn't here when obviously it was decided to go this route, and I'm uh, so I'm mindful of that. And I, I, I uh, understanding it's a state requirement. I suppose there's a bunch of hoops you got to jump through to make sure um, that you have one. I just I feel like maybe this gets us kickstarted longer term. I'm not sure. I'm a huge fan of paying this kind of money uh, to consultants when I I'm, you know, I feel like this is a um uh this is something that probably we 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 could uh do ourselves but um at the same time let's i'm, I'm gonna support this now because as i say i'm late to the to the conversation and um uh it, there's a lot on all the staff's plate so adding this would be uh, would be a lot right now but hopefully long term it can become some of the self-perpetuating and maybe gets updated but we may not need to devote these resources outside of the agency in order to get this done Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Uh, Mr. Sabo, is there public comment on this agenda item? Uh, we're on agenda item three, strategic planning update. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Your name will be called when it's your turn and you'll be invited to unmute yourself. Those dialing in by phone can press star six to unmute. You'll have three minutes to make your comment. Again, this is for agenda item three, the strategic planning update. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand at this time using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining us by phone today. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Sabo, um, uh, thank you to Ms. De La Torre and Mr. McTaggart um, for your thoughts and questions. I think um, Ms. Chita and Vera were all curious um, to see what this is going to, to look like. Um, I'll be, um, I'll look forward to the consultants um, when they, when they join um, uh, our meeting to talk with us about that. Uh, and uh, and uh, again, I, I thank you for for all the work and for for updating us uh, on this process. Thank you. All right, um, we are uh, we continue um, to wait for Mr. Lay. Um, uh, accordingly, let's move to um, agenda item number five, if we could, the public affairs update. Um, Ms. White, are you ready to talk with us about that? I am, yes. Wonderful, welcome, good morning. Welcome. Thank you so much, and thank you to all the members of the board. As mentioned, my name is Megan White, and I'm the Deputy Director of Public and External Affairs at CPPA. At last month's board meeting, you kindly concurred my hiring. Right, sorry, Ms. White, before you begin, can I uh, just break in briefly to welcome you so um, to the agency. I believe you began just, uh, what, maybe a month ago? Yes, I officially started my fifth week today. So yes, a month. Oh, fantastic. Well, we are really delighted to have you um, throughout its inception and with, I think, every board member we've had um, uh, over that time. Um, I know we are all deeply committed to our public awareness and guidance functions. And we are just really delighted um, to have you here um, and to hear from you today. So uh, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to update us. And uh, and please do go ahead. I apologize for interrupting. Oh, no, my apologies, Chairwoman. And thank you again. And as you can tell, this is my first board meeting. So <laughs> I'll know next time to wait for the formal introduction. But as I said, my name is Megan White, and I'm so grateful to join you all here today. And while I am new to the team, as you can tell, I do have a few public affairs and outreach efforts that I'd like to share with you. 
So as you're aware, CPPA's outreach to date has primarily centered around encouraging public participation in the rulemaking process and some light public awareness, such as the social media efforts that we will have this week centered around Privacy Awareness Week. And as we move into the next phase of research, our focus will center around educating the public about their rights and how to exercise those rights if they so choose. We will also provide guidance to businesses regarding their duties and responsibilities under the law, while being mindful not to step into underground regulation territory. To assist with these efforts, a month ago, we put out an invitation to bid on additional media and outreach services to help with research, strategy, and content creation. We're hopeful to have a consultant on board shortly and to kick off our planning and outreach starting this summer. Our work that I just outlined will be rooted in research. This will include qualitative and quantitative research efforts, along with usability testing and user experience research. We will also develop a public affairs strategy. This will include branding, an overall outreach campaign strategy for our organization, along with smaller outreach campaigns developed for specific groups. In addition, we will work with the consultant on content creation. This will include a possible website redesign, additional digital contents, and the development of ads, infographics, and translating materials into various languages. We're separately working on our complaint system, which we will preview for the board at a future meeting. I'd like to note that during every step of this campaign planning strategy, we will focus on the messaging being clear and engaging for all Californians. Our focus will be to take complex information and make it easy to understand while ensuring it remains technically and legally accurate. Our research and outreach efforts will be done through the lens of deeply understanding the diversity of our state. For example, we won't simply take materials and translate them from English into various languages without first ensuring the message translates as well. We'll consider approach, tone, and other factors as we create materials for various audiences. And while our general campaign will have a broad focus, we also plan to develop campaigns targeted as spe to specific groups, such as senior citizens, students, low-income populations, those with a limited formal education, and any ethnic or outreach out risk group where English is not their first language. Another important note, the media and outreach contract is complementary to, but separate from, the paid media placement contract, which covers the actual buying and reconciliation of paid media ads. I look forward to updating the board once the CPPA has selected a media and outreach services consultant and our work is underway. As a preliminary step, at a recent all staff meeting, we polled our team to get their feedback on the areas they feel should be the focus of our outreach efforts. Overwhelmingly, they shared that outreach is needed to both consumers and businesses in all areas. For consumers, they feel we should be focused on their rights including the right to delete, correct, no, opt out of sale and sharing, and limit the use of sensitive personal information. They also stated public outreach is needed on opt out preference signals, dark patterns, and what to do when you think a business is out of compliance. For businesses, they feel outreach is needed on whether the CCPA as amended applies to their business and what to do when a consumer exercises their rights. Of course, I look forward to the board's feedback as well. As mentioned earlier, our outreach efforts will be rooted in research. So the first stage of our public affairs outreach strategy will include polling. So as you have thoughts on topics that should be included in our qualitative and quantitative polling, please either share them with me today, of course, after I present, or as they come to mind, you can always send them to me via email or phone call, and I'll make sure that we fold them into our research process. One final note I'd like to share, while we are entering into the next stage of outreach efforts, we are certainly not starting from scratch. Of course, the CPPA team has spoken at conferences, talked with stakeholders and lawmakers, and made numerous strides on the outreach front. And of course, the team will continue to do all of these things. 
but at the same time will be engaging stakeholders more fully to inform Californians of their privacy rights and how to better protect their privacy if they so choose. We'll conduct further outreach efforts to businesses about their compliance needs and their obligations under the law. And that concludes my formal remarks and I'm happy to take any uh, questions from the board. Of course, I'd love to hear your comments as well. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. White. I have a couple of questions, but I want to open the floor up to the rest of the board first. If, it, if either of you have questions. Otherwise, I'm happy I would, to go I would just say I would just say welcome. Uh, mm -hmm. you, have, you have a giant task in front of you. Uh, I always think that privacy is is widely held, but thinly held in terms of people. They think it's a good idea, but when it comes time to doing something about it, they, they're busy. They don't have time to figure out their phone or their settings and uh, and just reminding them why it's important and, and how to take steps to uh, uh, protect their privacy is important. So you have a Herculean task in front of you and um, I wanna say welcome uh, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you for the kind welcome. Yes, I think we all second um, that. And I think Mr. McTaggart very nicely articulated some of the views that we've been hearing from the board um, throughout our, our, our tenure and some of the things that we care about. I also apologize. Apparently, I called you Ms. Lay instead of um, Ms. White. Um, I have Mr. Lay on mind because he and Mr. Thompson um, were the subcommittee um, looking at public awareness. Um, and I'm sure he would love to be here um, to hear your presentation. Uh, my uh, comment in addition to Mr. McTaggart's with which I fully agree is that this sounds like a very rich um, uh, program of, 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 um, of efforts um, and I commend you. And as he says, you have your work cut out for you. I was curious um, about the quantitative and qualitative research that is being planned. Could you say a little bit more about that? Of course, and I think I'll be able to share more once we have the consultant on board. But our belief as a team when we were writing the contract was that it was really important to pull people and get a good feel for what they already know, what they're interested in, but they don't quite understand before we start anything. Because any public outreach campaign, you know, you need to know what your audience knows, doesn't know before you can really start to craft the message. Our hope is also to test these messages before we launch the broader campaign. For example, you know, focus group to ensure that a proposed ad is actually conveying the information that we want it to before we move forward to production, to media buys, things along those lines. So I'm a firm believer in research prior to spending a whole bunch of money on something that probably that might not be hitting our target audience. Um, so those are just the general early thoughts in terms of outreach, quantitative and qualitative. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. That makes a lot of sense to me um, based on my own more academic research in the past that one of the things that we found was that people's understandings didn't always align with what was happening in the marketplace, even though their understandings might've been very reasonable. Um, they didn't necessarily align with what was happening in the marketplace. Um, and what theoretically they might understand from reading privacy policies and so forth. So research to help make sure that the message that and the information that is intended to reach the public is actually going to be available and understandable and, um, and have that message um, get to the public, I think is really important. So I appreciate that aspect of a very rich suite of efforts um, in particular. Ms. De La Torre? Yes, quickly, I wanted to join in welcoming our new member to the team. Um, I, I have a um, question on, I, I understand and appreciate um, all of the work that you laid out, but I was not able to piece out of um, that explanation if there is going to be more of um, a reach out beyond ads, is there going to be a reach out to um, organizations that engage with the community or directly to the community and just in general? And then in particular, if there would be opportunities for some of the board members that might wish to help with that outreach to participate in the outreach. Thank you. 
Absolutely wonderful question. And yes, we would love to have the board's assistance. I know you all are very, very busy, but as you see fit, opportunities for you to be part of the more grassroots aspect of the campaign, which in my mind includes creating partnerships. That's the external affairs part of my job is creating partnerships. And through these partnerships, trusted members seated within the community, if they're relaying our message to members of the community, that generally has a bigger impact on individuals. And I'm just speaking off of the research that I'm familiar with, with public and outreach efforts. But when the trusted source, such as a community organization is the one conveying the information, it tends to have more trust by the community. So I absolutely agree. A real focus is gonna be identifying those groups and those partnership opportunities cultivating those opportunities, and then ensuring that the message is delivered accurately to the communities that we are targeting. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that. I personally, there are opportunities in particular to reach out to the Spanish speaking community. I would love to be able to participate in those, learn more about their concerns around how their information is managed. And also, um, for women, given the different concerns that collection of information is creating now because of the um, approaches that already states are taking to uh, women's healthcare. Um, if there is opportunities for me to support that, I will be very much looking forward to those. Of course, if there is any other way in which I can support, just let me know. But those two areas are of special interest to me. I really appreciate you sharing that. I will certainly keep that in, in mind. And definitely, we would love to have your assistance in both those areas. Thank you, Ms. White. Um, Mr. Sabo, do we have public comments on this agenda item? So we're on agenda item five, public affairs update. If you would like to make a comment on this agenda item at this time, please raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone to unmute yourself. Um, your name will be called when it's your turn and you'll be invited to unmute yourself and those dialing in by phone can press star six. You'll then have three minutes to make your comment. I'm seeing Natalie. I'm going to unmute you at this time. Again, you'll have three minutes. Please proceed when ready. Thank you. I just have one question for Ms. White. I didn't hear a timeline. Do you happen to have one? that we could um, go by as far as uh, in preparation. Uh, thank you very much, um, Natalie. And I think Ms. White will take it under advisement. Um, I think it is probably timely for me to offer the disclaimer that I always have to offer that none of us are particularly fond of, um, which is that because of Bagley Keen um, and other constraints, we generally sometimes we get a we get a question that can be answered right in the moment but usually we need to take things under advisement um, and and come back at a future meeting so thank you very much um, for the for the um, for the question it's an important one um, and I believe that we will hopefully hear from Ms white with some more detail um, fairly soon absolutely happy to bring it back at a future board meeting thank you so much Ms white thank you um, Mr. Sabo, do we have further public comment at this time? Again, this is for agenda item five, the public affairs update. If you'd like to make a comment at this time, please raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature by pressing star nine on your phone. Last call for agenda item number five, public affairs update. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any further hands. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo, um, much appreciated. Thank you, Ms. White, and again, welcome. We're really happy to have you here and looking forward to hearing more soon um, on, on public affairs. Thank you, thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. Um, so uh, with that, I'm just having a look over the agenda. Um, Let's continue with agenda item number six. And uh, for any of these, if things come up that we find we want to recall when Mr. Lay arrives, we can do that. Um, but let's go ahead with agenda item number six, which is um, a policy and legislation 
update um, from our Deputy Director of Policy and Legislation, Ms. Maureen Mahoney. Um, Ms. Mahoney, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And I will hand the floor to you. Thank you, Chairperson and members of the board for the opportunity to provide a legislative update. I'll cover four main topics in today's uh, update on legislation that the staff is tracking, starting with an overview of California legislation, an update on the federal privacy landscape, and then finally brief updates on multi-state and international engagement, and it should be about five minutes. Uh, with respect to California, we wanted to make sure that several bills are on the radar of the board. The board may want to take a position on several of them at our next meeting, ideally no later than early to mid-July. And again, this is just an update, not an item for formal action. We felt it was important to keep the board informed uh, in order to allow the opportunity for meaningful input. So first uh, is bagley Keen bill in California that would affect the agency. SB 544 would allow state agencies to continue to hold board meetings remotely. It would require a minimum of one staffer to be at a physical location where the agency would take testimony from the public. Um, for context, staff have been supportive of measures that would promote broader participation from the public and allow the agency to operate more efficiently with our limited resources. So the bill has passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. It's on the Senate floor, um, but there was significant pushback from members of the committee who spoke in favor of requiring a quorum of board members to be physically present at board meetings. Next, several uh, CCPA-related bills. Uh, first, I wanted to mention SB 362, which would transfer the data broker registry from the Department of Justice under the ambit of our agency and creates a global deletion system. So consumers can delete their data from all data brokers in a single step. An agency have provided uh, technical feedback on the bill and a fiscal estimate to Senate appropriations. Next, AB 947 would add immigration and citizenship status to the definition of sensitive personal information under the CCPA. AB 1546 would align the AG statute of limitations under the CCPA with the agencies. So the agencies is five years, the DOJ's is one year, so this would raise the DOJ's uh, statute of limitations to five years. And AB 1194 would strengthen reproductive privacy protections by clarifying that CCPA exemptions don't apply when it's related to searching for or procuring contraception or abortion services, for example. And the next um, AB 331 uh, has to do with automated decision making. That would prohibit deployers of automated decision making systems from using these technologies in a way that results in algorithm algorithmic discrimination. Uh, it requires impact assessments, and it provides for an opt-out of automated decision-making. So this did raise concerns uh, for staff in that the legislature is seeking to step into an area where the agency is already tasked with issuing regulations. So we've liked our concerns in that respect uh, for the author. Next, I'm gonna move on to the federal update. Um, so we have an update on the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, the ADPPA. As you know, the board voted last July to oppose the bill as currently drafted, as it could significantly weaken uh, California's privacy protections by seeking to prevent nearly all of the uh, provisions of the CCPA and other state privacy laws. Uh, the bill advanced out of House Energy and Commerce last year, but it didn't advance further than that and, and died at the end of uh, the year or the end of the session. Um, however, the political landscape is different um, with the Republican majority in the House and uh, House CNC has done you know, six hearings on privacy. Uh, the chair, uh, McMorris Rogers, um, put out a recent statement indicating that the committee is still very interested in a preemptive federal privacy bill, although we understand that there are concerns in both houses about the bill in its current form. Uh, the bill has not yet been reintroduced um, as of when I last checked before this meeting. Um, suggesting that stakeholders are still negotiating the language of the bill. However, our understanding is that the new ADPPA could be introduced soon and marked up and even hit the House floor this spring or early summer and cross over to the Senate where it will likely face more resistance. Um, it'll likely be even uh, less privacy protective this year. Uh, in terms of engagement, the agency has been coordinating closely with the California legislature, the attorney general, and the governor's office. And I'm actually currently in the DC area in advance of uh, legislative briefings, including a presentation in front of the California congressional delegation this week on the bill. 
Other legislation that we're monitoring on the federal level that could affect Californians is um, Senators Blumenthal and Blackburn's Kids Online Safety Act, which was just reintroduced. Previous version advanced out of Senate Commerce last summer. Um, the introduced bill requires covered platforms to act in the best interest of minors, defined as under 17. Uh, another bill that was just reintroduced in the Senate is an update to the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Um, Senator Markey and Cassidy's uh, Children and Teen Online Privacy Protection Act, known as COPA 2.0, that would extend COPA's uh, opt-in to data collection requirement to teens um, and prohibits targeted advertising to children and teens, among other protections. Uh, we're watching both to monitor the impact on California's privacy rights, and um, both bills could advance out of the Senate this summer. Next, a uh, brief multi-states uh, update. There have been a lot of developments in the states with respect to privacy. A handful of states recently adopted or appear very close to adopting privacy laws, including Montana and Texas, which both have a number of similarities to the CCPA. We've been monitoring these closely and providing technical assistance to encourage consistency and privacy protections um, with our law where possible as directed by our statute. And then finally, with respect to international developments, um, as you know, the agency is already a member of the Global Privacy Assembly, an international body of over 130 data protection and privacy authorities. And I just wanted to briefly mention that the agency has recently been approved to join the Asia Pacific Privacy Authorities or APPA. Uh, it's for privacy agencies in the Asia Pacific region to share information and ideas about privacy law, technological developments, and addressing consumer complaints. And in general, we expect to step up our engagement in international bodies um, in the coming years to help encourage consistency and privacy protections. So thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions and welcome any feedback that you have. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ms. Mahoney, for uh, this um, apparently comprehensive, certainly complex <laughs> um, set set of set of updates. Uh, just as a clarifying question, I apologize. I was jotting things down as you as you said them. the The law that relates to data brokers, uh, I missed. Is that SB three sixty two? Is that yes? Okay, that's correct. Um, I didn't manage to get the number when you said it, and I just wanted to match it up in my head with what I was familiar with. Um, thank you um, so much for that. Um, so, um, Mr. Sible, um, I realized that we uh, it would not be appropriate for us to take positions on any of this. I, I don't think Ms. Mahoney is asking us for that at this time, but um, because those would have to be, that would have to be specifically noticed on the agenda. Um, is it appropriate, however, for us to sort of talk about these bills um, as a board? It would be appropriate to talk about it, um, but not to take any action with respect to it because they haven't specifically been listed as items that would be, mm -hmm. action would be taken on, um, on the agenda. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Suble. Um, and Ms. Mahoney, um, could you also give us a little, um, I know I know we talked about this when we worked on setting the regular meetings for considering legislation, one of which um, will likely be in July because of the California um, legislative um, schedule. Um, but could you give us a little bit of an update? I understand the federal schedule from what you said, but for the California schedule, um, how do these bills fit into their decision making process? Well, a general overview of the California legislative session is that um, as bills are introduced in the first house, they would have to um, advance out of that first house by June 2nd. Um, and then the California uh, legislative session ends September 14th. So bills would have to advance out of the legislature by that point. Uh, and then the governor would have about a month to sign those bills. Um, so, you know, most bills are still in the first house at this point, um, but soon, um, you know, we'll get a better sense of, of which ones are moving forward into the second house. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, questions or comments from, from board members? I would just say, wow, privacy is continues to be on the legislative agenda, and that's exciting. Um, Mr. McTaggart, and then uh, I apologize, Ms. De La Torre was first, and then Mr. McTaggart. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for the um, brief presentation. I appreciate um, receiving that information. Um, it sounds like in the future, we might have an opportunity to have a conversation depending on what moves forward. And I look forward to that. Could we um, have an understanding of what kind of um, information will be prepared by your office so that we can prep for that? Are you gonna provide summaries of the of those uh, proposals that we think are moving forward, maybe recommendation from the agency, what should the board expect um, to prepare for that meeting? Thank you for that question. Um, yes, exactly. So this was just intended to be a brief overview to put it on your radar, and then we'll provide much more detailed information um, in advance of any meeting where the board would um, be uh, expected to take a vote. So we'll be providing um, a bill summary analysis of um, provisions to pay particular attention to, and then staff's recommendation. Um, so overall, it'll be quite similar to the information that we provided on ADPPA um, when the agency took a position on the bill um, last year. Okay, thank you so much. Um, well, I have a second question related to the membership of the agency in um, different organizations that um, enable um, interaction between um, enforcement agencies. I, I um, appreciate the update. Um, I'm very glad to hear that we're moving in that direction. I have a very concrete question and then a general question of how um, the board is integrated into that. Um, so my concrete question is, have we reached out to join the um, Iber American Data Protection Network, Red Iber American de Protección de Datos, or is that in our radar? Is it a um, group that um, brings together all of the data protection authorities in Latin America? I believe, I know the FTC uh, often attends those meetings as well. I think the secret Tree for that group is the Spanish Data Protection Agency. Is that in our uh, radar? That hasn't been yet. So I really appreciate you flagging it and we will definitely look into that further. Okay. Happy to provide information and connections um, so that we can explore that possibility. Um, in terms of these different um, uh, networks, um, and just events and opportunities that enable that connectivity with other agencies. Um, it's there going to be an opportunity for members of the board that might wanna attend some of those meetings to um, volunteer to participate and how will that be handled? Are we going to maybe see a projection of next year, we're gonna attend this and that meeting um, at a board meeting and then perhaps members that are willing um, to volunteer to join those meetings can have that conversation or is that something that maybe might happen more in the background uh, through the chair or through or through the um, staff of the agency it's okay if we don't if we don't have a concrete idea i just want to kind of understand where we are thank you Good question. Correct. Uh, we don't have a concrete idea yet. We're still, you know, feeling out these different um, organizations to figure out how the agency um, might want to engage. Um, but certainly, um, you know, board member input would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, and do I understand, Ms. De La Torre, I think that I understood that you were expressing I don't want to put you on the spot, but that you were expressing interest or willingness to um, to be involved with. I, I I think so. In the past, for the last year global meeting, mm -hmm. I remember that there was a conversation. But I police, I don't remember if it was part of the board meeting or maybe a conversation with the staff on whether members of the board might be uh, interested and available to join that meeting. I don't, I, I recall that none of us went there, but I was just wondering if there's going to be like a process at the beginning of the year, we say, you know, we're gonna attend all of these meetings there, typically involve international travel. And I understand that there has to be some coordination because only two members can attend. So I was just trying to figure out how yeah. we're thinking about that. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Well, I was, 
Okay, I will not put you on the spot. I was thinking maybe we could gather interest <laughs> or uh, or willingness. Um, but um, but but yes, um, that's helpful. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney, for thinking thinking about that for us, um, Mr. McTaggart. Thanks. Um, so a couple a couple of points. The first one has to do with the legislation in California. So uh, am I understanding? And I'm sorry, I. I, I I'm not sure I heard the, or I'm not sure I listened closely enough to your answer to Ms. Delatory there. With respect to uh, the agency uh, or the board, you know, taking a position on the legislation, are you going to, is the staff planning to come back to us to recommend uh, us that we take a position on anything at a later date once it looks like something, you know, before, I guess, because if, if, if a threshold, if the timing is, uh, approaching for a committee hearing, wouldn't it, it would be, I think, useful for the people to know how we stand on these things. Um, so I'm kind of wondering about whether, if that's our plan uh, for a future meeting. Yes, um, you know, ideally the board would uh, be able to take a position, um, you know, no later than uh, early to mid July. Um, so staff will be coming back to members of the board with legislation that they may want to take a position on uh, with a detailed memo um, about the bill and the staff's recommendation. Uh, in case it's helpful just on that, you know, with respect to this one-year statute of limitations versus the five-year, that was certainly not something that uh, I intentionally put in the, you know, in the drafting. So uh, I think that's a very helpful uh, fix um, and uh, to the extent that's useful in your review of things and then the second thing um and not to put you on the spot in case you're not you haven't you're not an expert uh but certainly you're more expert than i am uh just in terms of you know good indifferent bad uh or or or, or more privacy protections middle of the road and less privacy with respect to the you were talking about montana and texas other other legislation that's being considered that's that's, that's passed or passing it'd be useful for folks to know what you what your what your thoughts are on uh, other states' legislation? Sure. Um, so we are seeing a variety of different bills, um, some, you know, a bit closer to California than others. Uh, some of the main things we're looking for um, when we provide technical assistance or evaluate uh, legislation in other states is whether or not it's easy for consumers to exercise. So their rights. For example, is there a requirement for businesses to honor browser privacy signals as a global opt-out? Is there a prohibition on dark patterns uh, in obtaining consent, making it um, more likely that consumers are able to exercise their preferences? You know, we also look to the definitions to see that they're comprehensive. Um, so I pointed out a couple, um, you know, Montana and Texas. Um, that do have a number of those provisions, um, you know, of a requirement with respect to a global opt-out, honoring browser privacy signals, uh, prohibitions on dark patterns, um, and a bit more comprehensive in the in the information that they uh, cover. Um, other states, you know, for example, Iowa and Indiana um, have, you know, before models that are a bit closer to what we've seen in uh, Virginia and Utah that are a bit less um, easy for consumers to exercise um, and, you know, generally narrower uh, provisions, definitions. Great. And, and just out of interest, are we getting a lot of uh, requests from other states, from legislators, hey, can you look at this? Is this good? Is this bad? Um, is this something that we're, we're seeing a lot of for, for, from the agency, from, you know, to us? Increasingly, we are. Uh, we're still a relatively new agency, so a lot of our work is just to raise awareness, to you know, let folks know that we're out here to be a resource. But states like Vermont and Hawaii have asked us to testify before um, their committees uh, to provide an overview of the California law, so um, so that they're aware of what's already being required of many companies. I guess my my comment here. Uh, uh... Chairperson Urban and the rest of the board and to Director Sultani would just be, I'm a huge fan of, of uh, any assistance we can provide to other states. Um, and obviously we're a bit further down the runway than, than, than some, most of the states. And so I think um, it's well worth, uh, uh, our, you know, devoting resources um, uh, uh, to, 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 to sort of proselytize about privacy uh, around the country. So uh, well done. I'm glad you're uh, doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. 
um, 1798.199.40, is it L, Mr. McTaggart? Um, I like to tout that one. Sorry, pardon, sorry say that again, I missed that. 1798.199.40, maybe L, I think it's L. Oh, um, cooperating with other jurisdictions and um, working to have um, uh, privacy laws that work together. Anyway, I like to tout that whenever I'm talking with anyone because I think it's really important and it's in the spirit of what you were saying to Ms. Mahoney. Yeah, it is L. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, thank you so much, um, Ms. Mahoney. Um, I have um, quite strong opinions on Senate Bill 544. I, I think that it would be terribly short-sighted of the legislature not to provide more flexibility uh, in board meetings and the public's ability to attend board meetings. Um, it is far more accessible for many people to be able to attend by Zoom. It is more accessible if you are not in the area where the board is physically, it's more accessible for a lot of people with disabilities. Um, it is potentially more accessible for uh, board members who have jobs and children and disabilities and, and things like that. So um, I do understand the desire um, to have a physical space where people can go. And so the bill seems to have that as a, as a, as a component. Um, but um, I confess myself slightly frustrated with the um, opposition to providing more accessible options um, for everybody who's involved so that we can all serve the public uh, as, as effectively as possible. Um, uh, I was wondering about the um, Senator Blumenthal and Blackburn's bill. Um, and it, as Mr. McTaggart said, I also don't want to put you on the spot um, if this bill isn't fully baked or you're not fully familiar with it. But I, I was wondering if you had any comments on how it related to the Age Appropriate Design Act in California that was passed last year. Is it a similar model? Is it different? Is it trying to do something differently or the same? I just, I don't know it very well and I don't have a good picture in my mind for, of it. Sure. So I'd say that the intent is largely the same um, to place uh, more responsibilities on businesses to put um, children's best interests um, front of mind. Um, and then, you know, the Kids Online Safety Act is a little bit more focused on providing um, parents and children with consumer friendly tools in order to um, exercise their preferences, whereas um, age appropriate design code focuses a bit more on, um, you know, establishing uh, several default um, protections to strengthen privacy. Um, so I would say overall, they have uh, kind of general intent, but certainly the devil's in the details um, in terms of, of how they um, implement those protections. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. And does that bill, do you know if it currently has a preemption provision? Um, it does speak to preemption um, to a certain extent. You know, it's largely silent on preemption, but um, there are certain uh, areas of law that are carved out of preemption, for example, with respect to student privacy. Um, so how it relates to California law or how it would affect California law um, will be fact specific and require kind of a detailed analysis of how um, the provisions of the of the bill interact with California law. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sabo, uh, do we have public comment or would you mind calling for public comment if there is any on this agenda item? Yes, we are on agenda item six policy and legislation update. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Your name will be called when it's your turn. You'll be invited to unmute yourself. Those dialing in by phone may press star six to unmute. You'll have three minutes to make your comment. First, we have Natalie. Natalie, you have been unmuted. Again, you have three minutes. Please proceed when ready. Thank you. This is for Ms. Mahoney. It was when you were mentioning the bills, you said Senate Bill 544. And then there was Senate Bill 362, but I missed the one in between. Can you just provide me that number? I could go ahead and research it on my own. Uh, 
Um, Chair, should I go ahead and respond? My apologies. Uh, yes, if you have it handy. Yes, my apologies. All right, uh, thank you for the question. Um, the bills that I discussed uh, relating to California are SB 544, SB 362, the Data Broker Registry Bill, AB 947, uh, which would add immigration and citizenship status to the definition of sensitive personal information, um, AB 1546, the Statute of Limitations Bill, um, AB 1194, which has to do with uh, CCPA and reproductive privacy, um, and then AB 331, which has to do with automated decision making. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, Mr. Sabo, do we have further public comment? Yes, next we have Josh Brewer. You've been unmuted. Again, you have three minutes. Please proceed when ready. Hello, can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Right. Thank you for the opportunity to, to comment on this. Um, I would just, I would love to see the board in kind of its, its trailblazing position in data privacy law in the country. And as so many other states kind of look to California to set the trend on things, I would love to see more robust definitions in upcoming legislation around AI. And for example, uh, there's an attempt in this uh, AB 331, there's an attempt to get into some of that by talking about uh, algorithmic uh, discrimination and artificial intelligence, automated decision tool. There's, there's an attempt to kind of get into what do these terms actually mean, but I would love to see more robust definitions. Uh, for example, I represent a client that hires and they use an automated tool to assist in hiring, but they program the tool with just yes, no questions. For example, if I'm hiring a chemistry professor, uh, they're going to ask the question, should the chemistry professor have a master's in biochemistry? Yes or no. And so to me, even though that's automated, the system is automatically going to screen out candidates that do not possess that. That's, that's an automated decision. I don't consider that to be algorithmic. I don't think that that's AI involved in screening that candidate. But again, I think the way that, that this bill and a lot of uh, bills throughout the nation are worded, I think it's a gray area of when do we cross the line into algorithmic or into artificial intelligence. So to, to, the, you know, to the extent that you guys have the way to influence that type of legislation, I would love to see more robust definitions and, and really give us a clear idea of when is artificial intelligence considered artificial intelligence, if that makes any sense. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Josh Brewer, for the comment. Much appreciated. Um, Mr. Sabo, is there further public comment? Again, this is for agenda item six, policy and legislation update. If you would like to make a comment on this agenda item at this time, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining us by phone this morning. Your name will be called. When it's your turn and you'll be invited to unmute yourself. This is the last call for agenda item six, policy and legislation update. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any additional hands. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo, appreciate it. And um, I appreciate the public comments on this agenda item. Ms. Mahoney, um, we very much appreciate um, all the work that you're doing to track policy and legislation and, um, and help provide the support uh, to those who are working on bills in our area that you discussed. I also, before you leave, I do also want to express my deep gratitude to you for all the pinch hitting you've done throughout the last year. Um, Ms. Mahoney joined us just about a year ago and she's been pinch hitting on public affairs, uh, for example, until Ms. White joined us while at the same time demonstrating her obviously deep expertise, thoughtfulness and ability to juggle a lot of different pieces of information at once uh, in helping us keep track of um, and, and do um, uh, fulfill our role with regards to policy and legislation. Um, if I recall correctly, Ms. Mahoney, you joined us not long before we released our draft rulemaking package for board discussion in May of 2022. Uh, we Soon thereafter, had a had a, a board meeting, our first in-person board meeting, and Ms. Mahoney um, came to the board meeting 
and um, our deputy director of policy and legislation sat behind a table and checked people in and handed out masks um, and has just generally been more than willing to do what is needed as we build the agency. And I wanted to just thank you, Ms. Mahoney, for being such a stellar member of the team, both within the realm of your own expertise um, and, and in general as we've been growing. So, um, so thank you so much for all of that. Uh, we really, we really do appreciate it. Thank you for the update. And we will look forward to discussion of the bills that um, live <laughs> and for which you need to give us advice and need us to take a position when the time is appropriate. Thank you so much, Ms. Mahoney. Um, okay, uh, let's go ahead and move to agenda item number nine, which is public comment on items not on the agenda, um, to give everyone an opportunity to let the board hear um, what they would like. Um, uh, we will return to other items on the agenda later in the meeting. Um, if we can go ahead and do that, let me um, let me just scroll down there on the agenda to make sure I have the number correct. All right, it is agenda item number nine. Um, as a reminder, uh, the panel um, or the board, the board members who are here, may not discuss or act on any matter raised during this public comment section, except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda for a future meeting. It may at times seem as though we're being unresponsive and we do not intend that. It is simply um, important for uh, us to do this in order to comply with Bagley Keene and make sure that both the board's goals and the speaker's goals um, are best met. Uh, uh, so we will listen today um, if you have public comments on anything not on the agenda, um, but we won't be able to respond in the moment. Uh, with that, we will look forward to anything um, anyone has to say from the public. If there is anyone, Mr. Savo, please uh, call for it now. We're on agenda item nine, public comment on items not on the agenda. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Your name will be called when it's your turn and you'll be invited to unmute yourself. Those dialing in by phone can press star six to unmute. You will have three minutes to make your comment. Again, this is for agenda item nine, public comment on items not on the agenda. If you'd like to make a comment, again, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining by phone. This is the final call for agenda item nine, public comment on items not on the agenda. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, in that case, perusing the agenda, um, we have um, talked about strategic planning, we've talked about public affairs, we've talked about policy and legislation. That leaves us with a discussion, uh, an update and discussion of our annual board meeting calendar and regulations, proposals and priorities and the new CPRA rules subcommittee update. Um, Mr. Lay is a member of the new CPRA rules subcommittee. Um, the regulations, proposals, and priorities discussion should really have us all um, here. And I know that Mr. Lay expressed um, some thoughts about the calendar um, in our last meeting and before. So um, what I'd like to do is take a recess to give him time to um, arrive um, since he has been delayed through no fault of his own um, and suggest that we recess until noon. Yes, um, Mr. McTaggart. I'm sure. Can I just ask what the policy is on this? Just because last time I, I was not able to make the meeting and it was held without me knowing. Actually, that Mr. McTaggart, we held, we talked about some things and then we made sure that we did not talk about items like this without you. Yeah, I just uh okay. I'm I'm I I'm a big fan of Mr. Lay. I just I feel like uh if there's a policy around this, it would be helpful for 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 uh, for everybody. Thank you. I will take that into advisement. Um, this is also a bit of an emergency situation. 
Okay. Um, so it was not expected. There wasn't really any way to plan for it. Um, in any case, I would like to go ahead and take a recess and see everybody back here at noon um, Pacific time. And I will look forward to it. Mr. Sabo, will you be able to keep the meeting open? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. We are waiting for Mr. McTaggart, it looks like. All right, we'll give him a minute or two to join. And Mr. Sabo, are you ready whenever we are? I'm always ready. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sabo. All right, um, now that Mr. McTaggart has joined us, let's uh, come back from recess and restart the meeting. This meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is returning from recess at 12.03 p.m. on Monday, May 15th. Welcome back, everyone. Um, welcome to the meeting, Mr. Lay. We're very pleased um, to see you. For Mr. Lay's benefit and the benefit of anyone who may be joining us um, after not having attended all of the earlier part of the meeting, let me just explain where we are in the agenda. Um, so we have completed agenda items one through three, so that's through the strategic planning update. We've also completed agenda items five and six, the public affairs update and the policy and legislation update. Um, and agenda item number nine, which is a uh, time for public comment for items not on the agenda. We have remaining to discuss today, um, agenda item number four, which is our annual board meeting calendar update, uh, agenda item number seven, regulation proposals and priorities discussion, and agenda item number eight, a uh, report from the new CPRA rules um, subcommittee, um, and number 10, future agenda items, in addition to Adjournment. So thank you all um, very much for rejoining. Um, and Mr. Lay, I do apologize that you missed some of the discussions. I'm sure staff would be more than willing to update you um, on what was discussed under those items. With that, let's uh, dive into agenda item number four, the annual board meeting calendar update. Uh, for this agenda item, Executive Director Ash Sultani will be providing us with an update consisting of the regularized calendar that has been discussed over the course of several board conversations over the last few months. Um, as hopefully everyone will recall, the board has simultaneously been working on what I've referred to as substance rulemaking at the moment, um, some public awareness work, along with some legislative review, with Ms. White's update, I think we're all excited about um, more public awareness work. And with Ms. Mahoney's update, I think we're anticipating perhaps some more legislative review um, and some building work where we are building out our practices, policies, and of course, the agency itself. 
So we've discussed regularizing discussions of topics that are perennial, especially those that happen on um, state calendar cycles where our input needs to fit smoothly into those. This includes, for example, the legislative cycle, the budget cycle, and the regulations cycle. We've talked about individual items to slot into those over several meetings. We talked about the budget in December. We talked about legislation in December. We talked about rulemaking in March. Um, the materials for those, including explanatory memos from staff, are all available under the relevant meeting um, on our meeting page. And we had an extended discussion about a regularized calendar in general on our March 3rd meeting, but it's something we've been talking about for a while. Um, I think there's been um, a general um, desire on all of our part um, to be able to have something that we can use to sort of just plan ahead and know what's coming, understanding, of course, that things also come up and there will be additional things. So um, staff have been working to implement this plan um, and I will turn it over to Mr. Sultani to bring us up to speed. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Thank you, Chairperson Urban, and thank you all. Um, first off, I just wanted to say um, happy Privacy Awareness Week uh, and happy Mother's Day yesterday to everyone's families. Um, some of you might be aware it's Privacy Awareness Week here in California. And I wanted to thank staff for all their updates demonstrating how far the agency's come along in these in those days since my, um, as Chairperson uh, Urban outlined back when the exec team was also handing out masks and setting up furniture at our board meetings. So um, I wanted to particularly want to flag that Miss White left out all the amazing work she's done already in the short month that she's been with us, both uh, internally, we had public service recognition week last week, uh, but publicly as well for our uh, APPA announcement that was Miss Mahoney mentioned, as well as Privacy Awareness Week, which starts today. Um, we will be putting out a set of announcements over the course of the week uh, to help inform Californians of their risks to their privacy uh, including highlighting recommendations by sister agencies like the DOJ and FTC and even organizations like the AARP. Um, I understand the first port post already went up to uh, social media today. So I um, just wanted to share that as it's Privacy Awareness Week. Um, and I hope that it's the first of uh, many efforts as we do to uh, raise awareness. Um, so with that, I'll just jump into the uh, opportunity to present the regularized calendar. And as Chairperson Urban highlighted, this is an accumulation of all the various items board members have brought up or staff have recognized are necessary to discuss over the course of the year. Um, it's modeled mostly after what other boards and bureaus do, although um, many just meet quarterly uh, for multiple days at a time to conduct board business. However, based on the conversations in the March and December board meetings, I understood the board to prefer to meet more frequently uh, so we chose uh, six times over the course of the year. Um, and the calendar was designed to meet and discuss certain items in appropriate times, for example, before we begin budget planning or to respond to pending legislation, as uh, Ms. Mahoney highlighted. Um, note the proposed calendar only shows regular items. It doesn't include additional topics that may come up uh, in addition to additional meetings that may come up, for example, um, for rulemaking, or uh, you know enforcement actions, or uh, even um, you know uh, emergency or uh, other other meetings that come up that we like the one we did last summer. Um, uh, one last point: certain items that will occur will be their first court, uh, occurrence, um, and so we may move those up in, uh, in the calendar, which um, I'll get into in a second, uh, and that will allow the agency to uh, to get certain tasks underway. Uh, for this year, and then it will fall under the regular calendar. Uh, importantly, in order to implement the calendar, we had to identify dates that don't conflict with state holidays and provide us ample time to notice the calendar in accordance with Bagley Keene. And we've looked carefully at um, the state holiday calendar, we've looked at um, availability, and we've identified um, the second Friday of the proposed months, uh, January, March, May, July, September, and November. Uh, with one slight adjustment uh, for uh, potentially one holiday. Um, and this is the regular date that the, uh, that the board will be set to meet. Um, and importantly, uh, you know, the, um, these dates will also let us schedule things like the 
the implant for and schedule things like the in-person meetings, right? So under Bagley Keen, we'll need to um, now pl plan quite a bit ahead in terms of travel and booking a location, et cetera. Um, Mr. Sabok, do you mind sharing that calendar uh, uh, and, I'll, and I'll walk through? Um, great, thank you. And so um, if you can zoom out a tiny bit. Um, so in January, um, uh, as the, the budget will be, um, uh, the, the planned January 10 budget and BCP discussion will occur. Uh, and then the board can provide input at that point as we did this year to, to provide direction for budget changes uh, you know, spring and they revise. In March, we'll go over the uh, public awareness uh, priorities, although as, as I mentioned, we decided to do that one this month here in May, as we just had our public uh, awareness, um, public affairs director start. Um, May this month, we're doing the regulations, the biannual or twice a year, uh, regulations, proposals and priorities. Um, and so we're gonna do that here in May and again in November. And that's where the board will discuss the priorities, uh, the regulations priorities until the next time we meet. That's again, separate from the actual substance of regulations where we meet, the board meet to discuss and um, approve or you know, uh, regulations, et cetera. In July, um, that this is when we will meet to um, hear and take positions on pending legislation and as um, Ms. Mahoney laid out. That's uh, opportune house as it uh, opportune time as it traverses from the first house to the second house. You know, importantly, as bills get through appropriations and on their way to the second house. Um, that's also uh, the time where we wanted to meet to discuss the um, budget plan for the next year's BCP. So um, you know, we have to prepare those in the fall, and so getting started in the summer is ideal so that we can start doing the research for hiring, et cetera. Um, September, we had slated for enforcement for the annual enforcement report out and priorities. However, as we haven't started enforcement yet, we plan to potentially do this one in July, just uh, when we have the um, deputy director of enforcement start and just give uh, the the board, we won't have a read readout obviously, but the board will have some ability to understand and provide input on enforcement priorities. Um, September is also when we need to do some administrative tasks like things like the delegation of authority, as well as an, a hiring update. I know um, one board member had asked uh, for reports on our diversity and inclusion metrics, which we will have through the state process at this point, but that occurs every August. And then lastly, again, in, in November, we'll have an opportunity for the board to um, consider and, and suggest potential legislative proposals that the agency wants to put forward. Um, our biannual or twice a year regulations proposals and priorities discussion following the one we have in May. And then uh, in addition, our uh, biannual review, which we performed or which you all performed last year. So I'll leave this up on the screen for a second. If uh, folks wanna ask any specific items or we can stop sharing and I'm happy to um, take input or, or, or answer any questions that come up. Thank you so much, Mr. Zoltani. Um, I'd also just like to highlight that um, the biannual regulations proposals and priorities, this is the discussion of collected items, priorities for coming efforts. Um, with regards to items that occur to board members, they would like to alert staff to. Um, as we've discussed, there's both the opportunity to alert staff um, individually at that time. Um, and also when we do the future agenda items um, item, if you'd like to alert um, everybody in the public setting, um, then um, please do bring them up at that time as well. These are not at all um, mutually exclusive options. And I have made a note to myself to remind people of that um, each time we do the meeting. So I just wanted to be sure that we were clear about that because we talked about both of the both of these things at one time, if I recall correctly, in the last meeting. And um, I'd also just like to thank you and Mr. Laird, who I know um, worked really hard to make all the different calendars, the budget, the legislative and all of that um, fit together. Um, and um, and to everybody in advance for what I know will be significant logistical 
uh, lift in order to uh, send us back to in-person meetings because we'll have to get space and audiovisual equipment and, and all of that. So thank you very much. Um, questions or comments from board members? Please use the raise your hand function if you can. Oh, actually, now that the um, screen is no longer shared, I can see you, so either one. Uh, Mr. McTaggart. It, sorry, um, Director Sultani, could you just clarify? I didn't quite catch. You said, uh, and maybe it was what the chair just said, but uh, the regulations in May, and then you said something, but that's not also the meeting. What was that? What were you saying? There. So, uh, sorry, if that's clear. So, so the the May and November um, biannual or twice week, twice yearly regulations proposals and priorities is simply the meeting where the board will bring up um, or, or will discuss um, regulations items that have been brought up over the course of the year that, or regulations items that the board would like to see worked on. That's not the actual meeting where we the board meet to review the act you know the a regulations package that's put forward right so if you recall last fall um uh the board met to approve um kind of re revisions to the regulations or met in i think in february to um finalize the regulations those are separate from these meetings they could very well occur on one of these months or yeah. they could ha have their own separate meeting so how are you you envisaging this happen if uh you know, there's three or four regulations that board members sort of support and it comes up. Um, so are you suggesting there would be like a separate standalone meeting or, or would it just be, oh, on these two dates is when we kind of consider all the ones that come up and have staff recommendation? Yeah, all the, all the new ones that come up essentially or when we want to reprioritize things because essentially this gives us the six month roadmap of what staff can work on in between that times and start pulling together different packages. I know today, um, Ms. Kim has her regulations priorities discussions, which capture a number of the, the um, suggestions that the board have made over the course of the last really year or so of regulations top topics and items, as well as things staff have identified through the rulemaking process um, uh, that, that may need to be addressed. And so today we'll talk about how to order that list and what's missing off that list and, and what staff should prioritize working on, recognizing that we also have a major regulations package that we're working on um, as part of the new rule subcommittee work. So it's really, you know, these, these times is, is to figure out how to de dedicate staff resources and onto what. Although I believe if there were an emergency, of course, we would, right. you know, something urgent, we would address it at that time. The other thing that I, I don't know that I heard you say, Mr. Sultani, but might be helpful, Ms. De La Torre and I went to rules school, <laughs> um, but I don't, um, I don't think anyone else has had the opportunity yet. I highly recommend it. Um, but OAL, uh, the Office of Administrative Law, um, generally wants us to give advance notice of our rulemaking for a year. Um, and so that November meeting gives us an opportunity to help staff prioritize so staff can meet that requirement as well. Um, okay, thank you. Other comments or questions? Ms. De La Torre? You're on mute. Apologies, I was on mute. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, Director Shultani, for putting this together for us. Um, I just wanted to confirm a couple of things. I think I heard you say that it will be the second Friday of the month that we should kind of block for these meetings to occur. Is that That's correct? I heard correctly. Okay, thank you. And then the second thing, um, and I think that you pointed to this that there are this is what we know is gonna happen every year, but there's gonna be different things that happen um, that don't repeat over the years this year. I anticipate from the um, subcommittee where I work, the new uh, rules subcommittee, there is gonna be a need for time, more time to discuss um, uh, you know, the different options for those rules and eventually process those rules. So that's not, included here, we will overlay it on the calendar as we uh, uh, think is appropriate. And 
then the second thing that I have been thinking about for a while is um, I asked a while back about hiring of the auditor, which I understand to be a board um, selected position. And I imagine that we will have to do the interviews as we did um, prior as a board. Um, and on that, I am not sure how it fits with the calendar, but I just wanted to express that if, um, since we are going to in-person meetings, and I recall during the interviews, it takes a lot of time to do interviews. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't get that done in time to take advantage of the Zoom um, version of the meetings. Um, I will appreciate if we could think about how to streamline that interviewing process. I don't know if um, maybe we can create a subcommittee or you know, just do things in a way where um, we try to uh, streamline the time that the board has to dedicate to that hire because um, I would prefer to avoid um, meetings that go over four hours if we if we could. Again, thank you for your work. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. And yes, at least my understanding, um, and staff has not disabused me of this, um, is that we can fit other items as needed um, into these meetings. We can also look for times for one-off meetings. Um, if we have spillover items or we have items again that come up that need to be addressed before they could be addressed on the calendar. Um, it's very helpful to, um, again, I've noted that down again here, um, thoughts about timing um, and very helpful to think about the chief privacy auditor in light of in-person meetings. I believe, please don't hold me to this because I will ask council to be sure, but I believe that we will need to be in person, but we would be able to ask interviewees to Zoom. Um, uh, however, that said, um, uh, it is absolutely the case that we should try to be as efficient as possible with that position. Um, so thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, any other comments or questions? Uh, Mr. Lay. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add that, you know, I appreciate staff for putting together this regular schedule. Um, I know we've been asking for this uh, and, and I appreciate having, you know, a much advanced notice of when we'll be reviewing certain topics. So uh, thank you, Director Soltani, and thank you, staff, for putting this together. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, well, I think we have some expectations in hand, um, which is wonderful, um, and can do some planning ahead. Um, and th this schedule is on the website with the other meeting materials, right, Mr. Sultani? So we can refer to it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Sabo, um, would you please ask if there's public comments on this item? We're on agenda item four, annual board meeting calendar update. If you'd like to make a comment on this agenda item, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Your name will be called when it's your turn and you'll be invited to unmute yourself. Those dialing in by phone may press star six to unmute. You'll then have three minutes to make your comment. Again, this is for agenda item four, annual board meeting calendar update. If you'd like to make a comment, please use Zoom's raise hand feature or press star nine if you're on phone. This is the last call for public comment on agenda item four, annual board meeting calendar update. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, and thanks to everyone um, for their thoughtful comments to the executive director. And thank you again, executive director Sultani and staff um, for all the work on this. I will look forward to seeing it in operation. Um, thank, thank you all as well. I just wanted to appreciate how, how much this helps with the, if we do go in person, how much this will help the planning. So thank you all for, for, um, for, for uh, supporting this calendar. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. With that, let's move to agenda item number seven, 
uh, entitled Regulations, Proposals, and Priorities Discussion. I would ask everybody to turn their attention to the chart that is included in your meeting materials for today under this agenda item. And that's on the website if you need to obtain it. This is our first semi or biannual. I think I've looked this up many times and indeed you can use both for both, which is very frustrating. Anyway, twice yearly discussion of collected rulemaking proposals and rulemaking priorities. Um, to place this in context, our major package updating the CCPA regulations in light of the California Privacy Rights Act was approved and took effect on March 29th. And we are, as Executive Director Soltani mentioned a minute ago, presently in the midst of preliminary rulemaking activities on some important topics related to automated decision-making, cybersecurity audits, risk assessments, um, and I'm sure Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay will let us know if I left something out when we get to the next agenda item. We'll hear further from them in a little bit. Um, as a reminder, this is our regularized discussion of the item staff has had a chance to preliminarily review and is ready for us to discuss and prioritize. If you have new items, you can bring them up for potential inclusion under today's agenda item for future agenda items or alert them separately. Um, with that, I'll ask again everyone to turn your attention to the chart, which I believe Ms. Kim is going to refer to, and turn it over to Ms. Lisa Kim, our Senior Privacy Counsel and Advisor, with my thanks. Ms. Kim, please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as discussed throughout the previous rulemaking meetings over the last year, staff have compiled a list of suggestions for additional rulemaking topics for consideration and prioritization by the board. <clears throat> this list basically includes a few buckets. First, they um, include topics previously considered by the board in our initial draft of the regulations, but were held back uh, to ease implementation. <clears throat> Secondly, includes talk topics that are identified by the board that were not implemented due to resource and timing considerations. And third, it includes topics raised by lawmakers for consideration by the board. Uh, staff prepared the chart that you see in front of you or that was included in the mater meeting materials identifying all of these topics. We have already reviewed the suggestions at a high level to determine that we have the legal authority to work on them and or the ability to work on them, albeit within the difficulty level identified. Uh, note, please note that there are also some items such as minor language improvements, as well as non-substantive or general cleanup changes based upon insights that we received during the rulemaking process. And those are not included in the chart below as they'll be incorporated into future revisions. Um, an example of one of these is that in section 7053A3, um, there is an example listed there as and that uses the term may as opposed to shall. And so those are the kinds of things we are going to take a quick look at, a closer look at and provide some information um, to include in future cleanup items. These are insights that we received during the rulemaking process. Um, we'll provide draft language on these items based upon the board's input on priorities as well and, and the bundling of topics for future rulemaking packages. Uh, with regard to turning your attention to the chart, regarding the topics in the chart, we have basically listed them in order of difficulty. For example, we have those in green and that, you know, AKA easy level of difficulty, and then some in blue, AKA easy to medium um, level of difficulty. And with regard to those two, you know, color differentials at the board's direction, staff can prepare language for the board to review when the appropriate rulemaking package is prepared for the board to review, or otherwise we can update the board on our progress during our next rulemaking discussion. For the other color-coded items, we'd like to discuss which of the topics, if any, the board would like staff to prioritize, taking into consideration the staff's already existing rulemaking priorities. As the board may recall, staff is currently working on regulations implementing CCPA's provisions on cybersecurity audits, risk assessments, and automated decision making. We are also analyzing the insurance code to determine whether any regulations are necessary to pro provide greater protection to consumers, in addition to a number of administrative regulations 
relating to the agency's operations that staff are evaluating as well. Given these resource constraints, given these resource constraints, staff is likely only able to take on a maximum of two yellow or orange topics or one red topic within the time of our next regulations discussion based on the annual rulemaking calendar Mr. Sultani um, presented earlier. That said, staff understands that none of the yellow, orange, or red items are urgent and need to be addressed within the next six months. With that in mind, staff seeks direction from the board as to which items they would like us to prioritize. For the topics the board instructs the staff to move forward on, staff will prepare language for the board to review and or update the board on our progress during future rulemaking, uh, during future board meetings. However, we do recommend that the board provide staff discretion regarding how to proceed to best move, move these items forward. Um, for example, whether to split them up and include them in more than one rulemaking package or include them in packages staff are already working on, et cetera. I will now walk the board through the chart of topics. I'm happy to take any questions that me, you may have along the way. Um, so, Ms. Kim, sure. sorry, before you start, could I ask a clarifying question? Was sure. I did, was I understanding you um, to say that if the board were to prefer to ask staff to work to implement all of the green and all of the blue, that would be all right? We could yes. close in a chunk if we chose. Yes. And then, and then in terms of resources, we need to pick from the remaining colors. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I apologize. Sorry if that's I just, I just wanted to be sure I had it straight. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So moving forward on these items, I'll walk you through the, the ones listed on the chart and feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Um, beginning first with uh, the green section, 7004. Uh, we, we would, uh, in 7004, we intend to, in, or upon the board's direction, we can include language that was previously held back to ease implementation and to harmonize with Colorado regulations. 7013, we've identified is, the, is to include language that was previously held back to ease implementation in that section. In Article 3, uh, one of the changes is to require businesses to include in their responses denying consumer requests information about where the consumer can submit a complaint. In addition, with regard to Article 3, um, the topic would be to include language harmonizing requirements for the different consumer rights. 7D24H we would revise language to ensure that businesses provide consumers the opportunity to request all of their personal information and not just 12 months of it. 7028, it would reinsert language regarding opting back in after having exercised a request to limit. 7302 uh, C1, um, it would be to clear, the change would be to clarify that it, an, an in person hearing can be requested even when it is not a hearing open to the public. With regard to the blue item, 7002E, um, the topic would be to insert language that a consumer can withdraw consent at any time. And 7026, it would be to insert language requiring businesses to comply with a request to opt out of sale or sharing in a timeframe that is commensurate to the timeframe it sells or shares the personal information. Now, moving on to the yellow and orange sections, um, the topic for 7003 is to require specific disclosures such as the notice at collection for mobile applications to be accessible in the app store prior to downloading. 7D50A4 would be to revise data security purposes for which service providers and contractors can use personal information. 7027 would be to revise and or add exceptions to the right to limit, including for HR or employee data, a prohibition on health-related research, and changes to the security incidents language. 7002, uh, the topic is to identify purposes for which businesses can use consumer personal information, 
um, for example, exceptions to the purpose limitations. Article four is to provide template or standard forms for service providers or contractor contracts. And then the next topic is voluntary certification is to draft regulations to implement this option of voluntarily certifying that you were to, you were to comply with the CCPA. On to the red or pink items. 7003 would be to include a reading standard for disclosures and or provisions that make disclosures more accessible. Article two would be to provide model notices and or other disclosures. Article seven would be to provide additional guidance regarding financial incentive programs. And then the next item would be business to business data to draft regulations regarding this topic and consider whether employment related communications during employment falls within the trade secret exception. The next topic is employee data to draft regulations regarding employee data and to consider whether any exceptions or specific rules should apply to employee data. And finally, access to social media APIs to require social media companies to provide APIs for, to I'm sorry, require social media companies to provide API for consumers agents. Now, these are all the topics and I'm happy to take questions uh, expanding on any of these or if the board would like to discuss any of these topics. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Kim. I think that was, was really clear. Um, I'm amazed that you so efficiently were able to present um, so much disparate information. Um, I have I have a favorite, but um, I'm going to turn it over to the rest of the board first and ask if they have comments or questions. Mr. Lay? Yeah, I, I have favorites as well, but uh, I, I just wanted to kind of reiterate one of the points that uh, Mrs. Kim made earlier about, you know, staff resources. Uh, I think there's several red and pink, or sorry, orange and pink items that I, I would like to see staff, uh, you know, approach. But I think one thing, you know, sitting on the subcommittee on the new rules, you know, we've been able to make much more progress recently because staff resources have been made more available after the initial rulemaking on, on the rules update. So uh, I am very sensitive to, you know, to, diverting staff resources to, you know, these important issues uh, before we're able to get, um, you know, the the new rules in, uh, in into, you know, proper rulemaking. So I just wanted to say that first um, and, and, you know, just as the rest of the board members think about uh, what to prioritize and, and how to choose between, you know, a lot of these important topics uh, to really think through Kind of how that would impact the timeline for the new rules because you know i am very sensitive to that and i, I imagine many of those uh, us here on the board and on the call are also sensitive to those to those issues thank you mr lay that's that's very helpful and Ms. kim i understood your analysis of what is a reasonable set um using staff resources took into account that you are working on on the, the major package. Okay, all right, thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, other comments or questions from board members? Yeah, I have a, I have a bunch of specific things I wanna, I wanna kind of go through and ask when the time's right. Um, but just to echo, I think what, what, what uh, Mr. Lay was saying, you know, I, I'm not sure as a board that it makes sense for us to kind of individually say, oh, choose this one over that one and do this one first. I mean, I think at some point delegating authority to the executive means, you know, delegating authority. I think what's 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 almost as, I guess my, 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 my suggestion would be what's almost as useful, I think, for the public. If they know the board supports a certain rule and then it will be forthcoming at some point, that I think sends, is a very valuable signaling tool for, you know, industry as they look at things because, uh, this happens in other areas of law, uh, tax, for example, where, you know, a tax authority will say, well, you know, we're going to publish regulations to, to, to do X, Y, and Z that haven't been published yet. And then folks kind of know, okay, well, that 
direction, you know, as being, we should, we should move in this direction, for example, because that's where the regulations are coming. So I, I think, you know, what I'd like to, I, I'd suggest is if we, if we all are in favor of whatever the end of the package ends up being today, that, that in and of itself, I think is an achievement. And then telling, uh, or, you know, instructing the executives to do what they can in the best way um, they see it, I think is, is, is commensurate with our, you know, our, our duty not to try to micromanage them. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Other questions? Uh, Ms. De La Torre? Um, I just wanted to mention that I agree with what was shared. It seems to me that there is an if conversation and a when conversation. And as to the when, I think that we should leave um, the agency the space that it needs to help us um, work through any possible changes and improvements. Um, and the EVE conversation is more appropriate for the board to have. I'm a little um, sensitive to the fact that it, it, it's been a long meeting already, and I'm not sure how long we wanna um, dedicate to going through this list. Um, it seems some members have um, detailed suggestions. And I just wanted to mention that I'm open to uh, potentially moving this to the next war meeting if we feel that that's appropriate. If we don't complete the conversation in today's meeting, I would prefer that than um, having a meeting that lasts three more hours, two more hours. Um, I'm not sure where is the preference for the other board members, but I wanted to express my thank you. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. I have a um, legal question and a process question for staff. Um, Mr. Soublé, are you available for the legal question? Yes. Thank you. Um, in principle, um, I absolutely support um, uh, delegating to staff choosing when, I think Ms. let me back up and just say, I think Ms. De La Torre put it very nicely. There's the weather to do something and then there's the wind to do something. Um, my understanding is that we do have to give direction on weather because we cannot delegate our rulemaking authority. Um, but could we just delegate the when and um, and um, put that in um, under staff's discretion? Would that be acceptable? Yes. I mean, technically, you can't delegate to staff the final authority on the adopting of the regulations, mm -hmm. and that's why we have. The motions once the staff comes up with the proposal and the language is agreed upon then you can delegate the authority to move it forward but mm -hmm. that is a decision that has to come from the board so you can uh, um, direct the staff to you know we will give you the uh, the authority to go ahead with the proposals that you believe are appropriate to move forward now and then the win is when they need to bring it back to you for final approval before going forward okay all right so it would be okay if we were, for example, if I were to formulate a motion that simply directed staff to work on any of the items on the list in the order that they think they should be prioritized against resources and timing, and then they could come back to us with language when they were ready. So that would be legally okay. Yes. All right, then thank you. And then I have a process question. Um, I am in general very much in favor of um, leaving discretion to staff um, who are experts and are in the trenches every day thinking about this very deeply. At the same time, I want to be sure that I'm sensitive to the fact that staff may want to have our direction on certain things. Um, and I think that we should provide that input and provide that time if it's something that staff feels would be helpful and that they would need. So for that, I would like to check with you, Ms. Kim, on your preference. Um, it would be helpful, especially with regard to the any of the red items, to know just generally if there is a desire by the majority of the board members to prioritize them. Um, it would just help because it's almost like a shotgun approach. If you say we could do anything, it requires us, us to look at everything to a certain level of degree um, in order to um, you know, inform the board from an educated point of view. 
Um, so if there is a priority by the board, it would be helpful for us to hear. Albeit, you know, it could be several, but you know, if there's at least some type of consensus as to what is coming to the forefront. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Kim. That's really helpful. And that that seems sensible to me as well. Given that, um, uh, I propose that the first thing that we do is check with the board to see if there is anything on this list that board members do not want to authorize staff to use their discretion to move forward. Is there anything on the list that anyone on the board would like to not authorize staff to move forward on? Ms. De La Torre? Um, so I'm sorry, but I don't know that I can answer that question because some of the descriptions are not fully clear to me. I think that we have to better understand each one of them to, and at least for me. Okay, so, for, so further steps would be would be necessary at this point for you. Okay, um, Mr. Lay? I you know, this is an interesting question. It's not like I don't want them. I think actually, you know, Article 4, providing templates and standard forms for service provider or contractor contracts, and um, Article 2, model notices and other disclosures. I think those are actually very important to me. I think those would really help businesses. But I think for me, that's a win question. And I don't think staff should move forward with that now. I think it would be helpful to see, you know, how, how industry responds and Kind of see, you know, what, you know, just to get not so that the, you know, the agency isn't getting ahead of the industry and how they develop their contracts and be able to see examples. So that to me, I think important things would be helpful for businesses, uh, but maybe not right away. Um, so I, I would like to see kind of staff wait on that, those two, but, you know, eventually get back to those because I do think those would be helpful for especially small businesses. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, I fully agree with you with regards to the model contracts, the orange one. Um, I think it makes very good sense to see what develops and, you know, let industry work to solve the, the equation in the way that works best for them. My favorite was the model <laughs> um, for, for the benefit of consumers. And because if I recall the public comments we received, um, uh, correctly, there were a number of requests um, uh, for, for such a thing. But I hear the wisdom in what you're saying, and it, to the extent that this conversation is helpful for staff, um, I think, you know, we can, we can just have it, and they can, they can decide sort of what the trade-offs are as they go forward. I absolutely hear the wisdom in what you're saying. Um, yes, Mr. Lay. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think, you know, especially the model notices and other disclosures, small businesses, could definitely use those. Um, I'm just not, yeah, I'm not quite sure when staff should be putting, you know, the finger, their fingers out there on, on, you know, the scale on how that should be done perfectly. Maybe there's a less verbose way that businesses are approaching it. Um, so yeah, maybe sooner rather than later for that one and maybe later for the, um, the templates and standard forms. But yeah, that maybe that's a good one. I think for us to highlight to staff that I think the board, at least two, two board members find important uh, and and maybe delegate to them on what's the best time to to do that. Uh, but yes, I do, I do think the model notices and other disclosures should happen probably before the standard forms for uh, the contracts. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, other thoughts? Other I know, Mr. McTaggart, you said you had a a, a list of thoughts. I think now would be a great well, time. So, um, and I'm sorry, those are those are the ones that we're bringing up that either oh, haven't been addressed. Sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, All right. Yeah, so, we'll hit we'll hit those when we yeah. hit our agenda item. Great. Thank you very and, much. And I think, you know, just um on the if if we were going to prioritize, you know, first of all, I think, and I'm sorry, I apologize if um Ms. Kim, if you mentioned this, I do think the AI, the sort of automated decision making is so important just nationally at this point that I, I would put all this on on hold to get those regulations uh, addressed you know, first, I think. Then in this list, um, if we assume that the blues and the greens are are there, you know, personally, I feel like the one that's in statute that is specifically very, very clear in statute is that the notice of disclosure, the notice has to be available before you um, download the app. 
in the app store so that you know what you're getting into, so to speak, and you don't just kind of lightly go into it. And that's yellow here. And I think, uh, I, I just don't think we have any choice in statute. Um, and I think that's an important one. And then the one uh, in the purple that I'm kind of a big fan of is, is trying to figure out a way around the employee um, data, not with respect of, with respect kind of the work product. Um, so that's, I think, 145N. Uh, um, cause employee data already is protected under California law, but, you know, if, if you think about the, uh, the work product of the employees during the time they've, they've been employed, that to me is something that is not, um, it, privacy protected. So I, I would like to get that trade secret, um, uh, area examined, uh, as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. I think you, you probably saw heads nodding about the automated decision-making package. Um, so I think that staff hopefully knows we're behind them 100% um, on, on that work. Ms. De La Torre? Yes, quickly, since we're now, I think, talking about the things that we see as priorities instead of things that we want to eliminate. Um, so I have two quick things that I wanted to bring up, which are not per se in the list, but I think they are related to the list. One is um, revising the current rules to do something that I think from a legal perspective is helpful in any document, which is capitalize the defined terms and use the capitalization consistently. Colorado did that, and I find it really helpful when I read the rules. There is one word in our statute in particular, which is collect which is a defined term, but sometimes in the rules, I think we're using it not necessarily as a defined term. So just simply taking that approach of making sure that the definitions are capitalized throughout the rules, I think um, could add clarity. So I will urge the staff to look into that. It's not necessarily a substantial change, but it's just trying to make the information more clear and accessible. The second thing that I wanted to mention is the idea of defining the term of controller and processor in the rules and using those terms consistently throughout the rules. This again wouldn't necessarily change the meaning of the rules, but I think it will go a long way to make the information more accessible to the compliance professionals that are working to understand and implement the rules. I think it will also make it possible for contracts that aim to comply with California law to be more consistent with those that are mandated now by eight other states and notices as well to the point that um, the chairperson made before about making information more accessible to consumers. I think to the extent that we can think about whether it's possible for us to align our terminology with the terminology of the other states that have enacted, we will make it less confusing for the consumer um, as right now they are exposed to your multiple um, uh, notices depending on the state where they reside, they might change the state. It's just, um, just a, I think a better drafting approach um, I open this for discussion, and I think that if we decide that this is something to look into, I will consider prioritizing it, because as we draft the new rules, if we decide that it is a um, um, good approach to consider defining controls and processors, obviously the new rules will be drafting uh, using that terminology, and I think they will better align to existing frameworks such as Colorado. So for that reason, I will suggest that if there's agreement within the board on the idea of looking into that possibility, we prioritize it so that we can implement it already in the um, new rules subcommittee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. De La Torre. So that, that is a new item. The last one about the controller definition. It's not. A, uh, I, there is. Um, so I, I'm not one. Of, I'm not sure what were the um, things that were suggested in prior meetings. I don't have that list. I don't remember personally referring to this specifically. Um, so I, yeah, I don't. 
I don't see it in, in this list, but I don't, I don't see a reason why the board could not suggest things that are not in the list if they are helpful. And in this case, I thought that if we were going to consider that, um, uh, having that conversation prior to releasing the new rules will be actually beneficial. Um, it's a question, it's just a question of timing. It's a, and, and whether the discussion is, is properly noticed. Um, I think, um, Ms. Kim, though, you've, you've recorded that, correct? Yes, yes. Um, I don't believe the defining of processor or controller was mentioned previously, but that said, you know, we will take it on to, in, under consideration um, as a new item that the board or a board member is considering or wants us to include. All right. Um, is there anything um, else that would you, you would find particularly helpful from us, Ms. Kim? I'm going to take a look at my notes to see if there's any further direction that I need from the board. Um, but at this point in time, I understand that the board is giving us this giving staff discretion to prioritize this list of items to determine what makes the most sense on a, uh, what, what makes the most sense in moving any of them forward. Um, and thank you. Ms. And, and I, I will I'll formulate sense. a motion so we all know. Thank I just you. Wanted, I that just, would be helpful. <laughs> I just wanted to check in. All right. And then further thoughts from board members. I have Mr. McTaggart and then Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. And I did just to clarify when you said it's a question of properly noticing. You just did you mean um, that? Ms. De La Torre's comment was new and it's going to take place after this motion, more properly, whatever should take place after this motion on the stuff that's already in this table. Correct. My, my understanding is that we have to notice anything that we action and the motion is an, is the, the action. So we have to notice it with sufficient specificity for the public to be notified that that is what we are taking action on. It's okay. just a matter of putting it on a list to vote on, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that, so it, it's putting on the list so staff can look into it, just like with the, with the, um, with the agenda item for future agenda items. I see, okay, yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah. I, I like it, but I, okay, I see what you're saying, thank you, yeah. Yep, thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, Ms. De La Torre. Um, so I wanted to add, um, a couple of things in 702, which we discussed when the rules were being approved, I see a reference that I don't completely, um, it's a summary. So it's difficult for me to really understand what the, um, you know, what the, um, let me rephrase that. I'm not sure that we can give clear direction to the agency on some of these items with, out far there discussing uh, discussing the items because what we're looking at is, is a very high level summary. Um, so um, with 7002, I mentioned it when we were approving the rules, there's a need to, I think, reorganize the test so that we can align them with Colorado and the rest of the world. There is also a need to consider for research purpose, statistical purposes, and um, journalistical purposes, whether there should be room for an exception there. There is such a um, uh, possibility for derogations under GDPR. Um, I understand that Colorado has a different implementation. They don't specifically have um, references to those three purposes to my knowledge in the rules, um, but um, it deserves a longer conversation, I think, than just a one-line reference in a list. Um, so perhaps this is an item that we can make part of our conversation. My concern is that if we do not, we might not be giving clear um, instructions to the agency on where we are with some of these points, where, which can cause them to work in a direction that ultimately 
not useful because we haven't had an opportunity to have a more granular conversation. I imagine there are other items here. Um, I think employee data is another one where there's been a lot of um, requests from the regulated uh, organizations on providing guidance. And I don't know that I completely understand the point that Mr. McTaggart made before on, on what he thinks should be a priority. Um, I think that at the minimum, we should consider revisiting the purposes for processing and creating purposes that are specific to employee data because the current purposes are not really designed uh, for employee data and it's difficult to adapt them. Um, so I, I don't know where the balance is between having this conversation and providing guidance and then perhaps creating a space in that future meeting to have more of a granular discussion on some of these items, but I leave it to the chairperson to help guide us through that. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. And to be clear, this is not board members signing up for ultimately approving or disapproving or trying to make a decision based on the brief description in the chart we have today. This is just, as I understand it, helping staff get a sense of where our thoughts are on the issues, and they will bring to us more detailed um, background and guidance that we can talk about um, in more detail. So I, I think that's in line with what you were saying, um, but that is that is my understanding. I do agree that we will need to have a more detailed conversation, for example, about the things that you, that you mentioned, um, and I certainly need more background. Um, on those. I, 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 um, like I said, I leave it to the chairperson to decide how to guide us uh, through, through this. I just wanna me make sure that we're efficient with the staff time mm -hmm. and that if there's a um, second conversation that we're gonna have in the next meeting, maybe they can dedicate their time to the things that are outside of that second conversation between now and the next meeting so that they, they don't, um, work in a direction that we haven't necessarily agreed upon or discussed for particularly as uh, Ms. Kim mentioned, some of these harder, more difficult items um, that will uh, require more staff time. Right, yes. It is, a. I think it's a layered process. Um, if they have a sense of if we have priorities, that helps them decide whether where to fo first focus their efforts to produce the background necessary to have that more detailed conversation. It doesn't mean, as you so nicely put it earlier, that the detailed conversation isn't going to happen. It's just a question of the timing and the staging. Um, Mr. Lay? Yeah, so you know, while we're on the topic of you know, providing, providing staff uh, direction, uh, at least from the board, on what to prioritize, uh, I, I would second um, Ms. De La Torre's, um ask that you know staff prioritize you know and and Mr. Allister, uh, Mr. McTaggart's ask that uh, we we prioritize looking at the employee data, um, and, and you know the exceptions of that and and how do we approach that as well as um, maybe on the on the easy side of things just for to help staff out on you know what at least from this board member we should prioritize is you know. Article three language harmonizing requirements um, that that to me seems uh, important. You know we can harmonize wherever we can. Uh, and and just a final note, unrelated to this, is that uh, my internet connection is very poor. So apologies, I can't see any of you all. Uh, you can see me, but um, so if I'm missing any body language, uh, that's that's because I can't see it. Thank you, Mr. Lay. We can see you. I don't know how that feels, <laughs> but it's nice. You know, it's nice to see you. Um, Mr. McTaggart. Thank you. Um, you. You know, I think one way to think about this part of the of the meeting is is and in the future would be, you know, do, do, do we the board think that the house is on fire and so you know everything needs to be dropped to do one thing? If not, then hey board, go ahead. Hey administration, you know, executive, go ahead and do this because we will never know whether. You, you get three of the yellows for one red or this all of a sudden something changes and the red gets easier and, and nor do we kind of want to be involved in that so i think that um 
so, you know, for example, I support, you know, what Ms. Ms. Del Torre was just saying about purpose limitation, you know, very important. I think the one thing to, also to her point about sort of the lack of granularity, one, one benefit we may be missing, uh, given the staff is already putting this time and effort into summarizing it this way. So in the future, I, I personally would really love to have like a running kind of total, so to speak, of like, these are the areas that the CPPA is working on. These are the areas that have generally gotten board support. And so here's a list of regulations that are coming. They may be coming in six months, they may be coming in a year, but, but they're coming. Hey, everybody, take a look at this because while well, these are the actual regulations, this is coming down the pike. And if they're in, if they're if, if they could be in greater granularity, then there could be even more of an indication when you're building your app or you know, you're 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 looking at what kind of as a, when industry is figuring out what to do they can get a sense of what's coming. And now, of course, the final regulation may differ. But I, I do think, and I'm not trying to get into underground rulemaking, but I do think, you know, we're, here we all are instructing staff to approve or to, to go forward and, and regulate in these areas or come back to us with regulations that, for us to approve. And so I think there may be an, an additional benefit for not a, not a lot of extra effort um, when, Ms. Kim, you're putting together the, the, the list of sort of in the future or when you, if we come back to the next meeting and, and amend this, so that anybody could at any time go go look and see what what regulations you know the administration is working on and get a, a you know a, a kind of closer sense to um, or as granular a sense of, as possible of what what we're working on. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, I I gathered that that was sensible. I worried that I didn't. 100% follow and I so let me try, let me try and say it better you know if let me just pick an example um or pick the example that I that I cared about the the one about requiring specific disclosures well that's actually pretty um uh, well so that's that's one where it's which is not granular that is pretty pretty clear so require specific disclosures for mobile apps to be accessible in the app store prior to downloading Maybe you can make that even more clear so that, you know, um, but, uh, and make that a mandatory step before you download it as per the statute. Now, if I'm designing an app and I know that the CPPA has said, the board has said, yes, we'd like to, you know, we'd like you to come back to, with regs addressing that. I'm thinking to myself, well, unless I want to redesign it in a year, I might as well design it this way in the first place, potentially. I'm just saying that. Um, and uh, what are, well, so actually, um, maybe Article 7, it's in pink, provide additional guidance regarding financial incentive programs. That's maybe less descriptive. And so, because what's additional guidance? So to the extent that it was that descriptor was more descriptive, um, it would give industry a greater sense of um, what's coming down the the, the the pike and allow people to kind of say, okay, this is where California seems to be going. Does that make more sense? Um, I am working to square it with the thought of discretion. Um, my, I, I, I hear, like I said, I hear, I hear sense sensible info in there. I, uh, my view of it is that if we are going to give staff discretion, the best approach would be to have the list, to add to the list in the various ways that we can. So for example, Ms. De La Torre has asked about the definition of controller um, and processor. And um, I would uh, ask for Lisa's input on whether sort of having a running list that maybe we um, check in on makes sense. Um, my understanding was that the calendar was um, set up so that we would check in on the list as a group in each of our uh, twice yearly meetings. And that is a way to make sure that we're all basically on the same page um, and that we've properly noticed everything. Um, I very much support giving staff the discretion within that time frame um, to figure out what it is that they should be doing. And I guess while I see that there could be value um, to providing more information, I worry that we would run into sort of the winds of Bagley Keen and um, accidentally making promises that we don't know we're making and, and, and so forth. So in terms of relative value, um, my feeling is that 
um, we try the biannual schedule um, for the next six months um, and see where we get. And, and that, of course, includes collecting items as they come up. And if anything is urgent, um, of course, addressing that on a more urgent basis if necessary. Um, but I worry that we could accidentally, and I know this is in no way your intent, Mr. McTaggart, um, given your thoughts so far, uh, to complicate things um, for staff in a way that we didn't intend to. Um, Ms. De La Torre and then Mr. Lay. Okay, thank you. I um, So I, I, I have a related question, which is if there's changes moving forward based on this conversation, and then there's the subcommittee that's working on the new rules at the same time, um, do we have a plan on how that overlaps? Um, yeah, I just, like, for example, the change that I suggested, if we move forward with that um, defining controllers and processors, it will have to be implemented on the new rules as well. So I don't know if it may, I don't know if it, if it makes sense to fold some of that under the subcommittee. I mean, how can we make it easier so that the staff don't, doesn't have to compartmentalize things um, and the subcommittee can move forward at the same time? Um, maybe the staff has a plan for that. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm, I'm thinking also in, just in terms of process, we have a package coming, right? And there is a whole administrative piece of moving that package forward once uh, we start the official process. So I'm envisioning some of these changes going forward with the new rules package. I just wanna check with everybody and make sure that that's kind of how we're all envisioning it, that when the new package comes in, it will just not be the new rules, but also some updates to the red line to the existing rules. Uh, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Yes, I think, you know, this is where the wisdom of giving staff discretion really shows its um, mettle in, in this and, and in other places, but in this place, um, I think that has been introduced. And in terms of how it might interact with the specific language of the package that your subcommittee is working with staff on, I think that's something the staff's expertise um, can be deployed to decide so long as we've given staff um, discretion to work on things. Now, we won't be able to solve all problems for all the future all the time with any motion, given the fact that we can't delegate rulemaking authority in a general sense. Um, but I think that by giving staff discretion, we can let them maneuver um, uh, within understanding sort of what our priorities are. And we've been very clear that our priority is that package. Um, and then we've kind of given some thoughts about other things that we like, but my feel, my thinking, my understanding of the conversation of the board so far um, is that what we uh, mostly want to do um, is to have staff have discretion to decide the timing of things, um, leaving aside the automated decision-making, et cetera, package, which we all understand is, is moving forward and we would like to move forward um, at, as a, on a priority basis. Um, Mr. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Sultani, um, is it all right if Mr. Lay makes this comment so he doesn't forget what he was going to say? Of course. Okay, Mr. Lay? Yeah, um, I think, you know, what uh, Mr. McTaggart was saying around, you know, providing advance notice, I think that will be solved when staff comes back with the priority list, right? Um, that way the public will know kind of what, what well, the board has already given its input on what we think is should be prioritized. Uh, staff has their discretion. They're gonna develop the priority list and that should hopefully resolve uh, the issues of, you know, what is upcoming, what businesses perhaps should uh, be prepared for in the future. Um, and to some extent, perhaps, you know, we'll also allay uh, Mr. Latori's concerns around, you know, if two things are happening at once, perhaps this control process or discussion, uh, if that's really high up on the priority list, um, then, you know, I think the subcommittee will hopefully have notice of that from staff. And, uh, you know, I think that should hopefully resolve most of these issues that have been raised recently um, around 
a providing notice to the public and to uh, around what the board is prioritizing and making sure that staff is integrating what they are going to prioritize with the ongoing rulemakings that we have. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, Mr. Sultani. Thank, thank you all. I just wanted to kind of um, just echo some of what I've heard just for clarity and also just restate. Um, as, as, I, as Ms. Kim laid out, this is this conversation, or let me, let me, let me, let me not paraphrase Ms. Kim. So, so, so the goal of this conversation, I think, is, is at least from a staff perspective, or as I see it, is for information capture and resource prioritization, right? We want to essentially go through the past year and then subsequently past six months as this process continues and capture, acknowledge, and then prioritize the topics that the, the board want staff to begin researching and working on and dedicating resources to separate from the say the new rules, the existing stuff that's been prioritized. And as Ms. Kim laid out, there's limited resources to do this. I think the question is um, essentially what what order, and I think Ms. Urban, your 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 um, attempt earlier to cross things off the list is helpful because um, that at least forecloses any necessary research on those items. But even on the ones that are on the list, the question is what do staff then prioritize given the ongoing um, other priorities? And just to respond to Ms. Delatore, I will just say that um, I don't necessarily, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that this will, the, the, some of the items, for example, even in green, will 100% be part of the next package or they may be separate packages. They may, there's other considerations with rulemaking, collecting comments, doing uh, economic analysis that staff need to consider in how to organize and allocate those. And I, and I appreciate the kind of the discretion the board are giving to staff to, to figure out how to package things up and bundle them because we have to give notice to OAL, we have to you know, run the economic analysis. The hope that we had hoped is, is as to, to echo Ms. Kim's first point is, we have a list, the green and blue seem doable by the time for the, you know, for us to report back on in the next six months until the next time we meet. Um, and then the question is of the remaining items, are there one or two mindful of, of Ms. Kim's uh, observation that we wanna prioritize um, or, you know, it's from this conversation, a lot of them are important and the agency has a knowledge, a lot of them are, are a priority, but are they a priority that we need to address in the next six months? is the question, recognizing that we may not even be able to address even the one, um, but we can certainly uh, report back out in the next six months. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sultani. And I believe that the board is saying we've offered some thoughts on some of our favorites, but we think that you have the most information about timing. So, um, let me, why don't I see if I can formulate a motion and see if that captures the, the, the thinking that, that um, behind this conversation. Uh, Ms. Kim, do you, would you like to speak before I do that? Yes, if I could just, you know, um, I believe the point of this conversation also was to give the board members the opportunity to discuss these items just because in previous conversations, they have identified item, but but never got the sense from what other board members as to whether or not it was an interest of other board members. So I believe that the intention of creating two spaces within the room uh, within the board calendar, um, both like in May and in November, was to provide that opportunity to have that discussion among board members to opine or provide feedback. Um, all that said, um, I also wanted to clarify that. If there is a particular item on this list that you know um, a board member has questions about, this would be the opportunity to have that conversation, given that in the next meeting, we will be focusing on other rulemaking topics that are ongoing priorities. So that that is what um, staff, well, myself would appreciate some, you know, if, if you have questions about any of these topics, um, then ask them now so that I can answer them so that you can, um, so that the board could have the full understanding of what this list is comprised of. That, that would be the most ideal um, situation, at least for myself. 
Thank you, Ms. Kim. For my own part, um, I appreciate that. For my own part, I think that questions I might have are more likely to arise at a point where we're considering a little bit more detail. I hope that's okay. Um, I, I, I absolutely understand. Um, uh, I understand what you're saying. And it may be that just this list hasn't prompted higher level questions from me personally. Um, Ms. De La Torre? Uh, yes, I have a couple of specific questions that might be helpful to Ms. Kim. One question is on the employee data, and it's not a question to be answered right now, but just a question to be highlighted for future discussion. On the employee data, um, whether creating um, a list of purposes that is specific to employee data is something that is um, beneficial and visible, I believe it will be because it's really difficult to fit the uses of data for HR purposes into the descriptions of the purposes that are in the law. But that's one question to consider. And um, I think it will also be very helpful in notifications to employees. Currently, um, the notifications are probably listing the purposes that exist in the law, which are not intuitive if you're thinking about how data is used for employees. Um, the second one, which I have mentioned multiple times, is uh, 7002. Um, um, I will appreciate looking for ways to align our test to the Colorado test and the test that exists in all other jurisdictions. It will be um, very um, useful for um, professionals that are doing compliance to have those lists aligned so that it's easier for them to go through use cases and decide whether there is a need for consent of the user or not based on the secondary um, use test. Um, I, am, I will appreciate a presentation on how our structure for purpose limitation works um, vis-a-vis the other opt-out rights that are in the law. Um, the secondary test that has been created in the rules, if it fails, meaning if there is no sufficient connection, the mandate is to obtain opt-in consent. But at the same time, there's a number of opt-out consents that are in the law. I've never really have seen that structure quite the same way in other jurisdictions. So I wonder how how can it best be made clear to consumers if they have like an opt-in and an opt-out right that might overlap? And I'm happy to maybe have a separate conversation with Ms. Kim if, if that's helpful to better communicate um, around that question. I know that there are answers that were provided in the EFSR, but I just, I just, will appreciate some form of example because the EPSA says that both the opt-in and the opt-out apply at the same time. Um, and then on 7002 as well, um, scientific research shouldn't be an afterthought. If we do not create the spaces for scientific research to happen absent consent of the consumer, I think that we are putting our uh, framework at risk of um, diminishing um, um, what we call data philanthropy, which is where private organizations actually offer their data to researchers uh, for beneficiary uh, purposes to society. Um, same thing for journalistic and statistic purposes. So I understand it's hard. I'm not taking away from the fact that it might be hard to define this and we might need time to do it. But to me, it is a priority to make sure that we think about how our law not only um, discourages uses that might not be beneficial to the public, but also it doesn't impair uses of data that are beneficial to the public, which is what, um, why I think that a carve out for um, scientific research is something that we should consider. I hope that was helpful, Mrs. Kim. That was very helpful, thank you.
Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and see if I can formulate a motion. So we have it. Um, please be patient with me while I think this through a little bit. So we need to um, delegate our authority appropriately. We would like to give staff some discretion. So I plan to ask for a motion to direct staff and authorize staff to one, proceed with developing rulemaking proposals on all the green items on the chart titled potential regulation proposals included in the meeting materials for today's meeting, all the blue items included on that chart, and any items of other colors included on that chart that in staff's discretion, staff believe are an appropriate use of resources at that time with the understanding that staff have discretion to develop any of those proposals any of the proposals on the potential regulation proposals list um, on the time according to the timing that makes sense um, in staff's judgment and give staff discretion to package the items with existing rulemaking priorities or separately in different rulemaking packages, updating the board during the next rulemaking priorities meeting. I don't know if I got everything in there and I don't know, Ms. Kim, if that works. I can, I can try to clean it up um, after we have public comment. For public comment, I always like to at least have the meat um, on the table so they understand what's going on um, and can respond if they would like. But does that, does that work and um, does it work for, for board members? Yes, it works for me. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Uh, Ms. De La Torre? I think that we should give some consideration to the items that different members have highlighted as important to them that are outside of the green and blue so that the staff knows to uh, consider prioritizing those. And I tend to agree with Mr. Lay on the um, model notices and contractual language. I don't think that is something that might be um, a high priority at this point. And I think that I heard um, chairperson mentioning the same thing. So maybe there's a way that we can at least eliminate some, some items from here to the next meeting um, so that we give actionable feedback. I don't disagree. Um, I hope that that is helpful to you, Ms. Kim. I was hesitant to put it in the motion because I don't want to limit their discretion in terms of authority. Um, but one thing that I could do, let, let me think about it while we take public comment and see if I can restructure things a little bit. And, and I want to mention one more, the access to social media API. I don't think that I have heard that from any board member. I understand that there might be a petition to the agency from, um, other sources and is listed here for that reason, but I don't recall any board member making it a priority. So maybe it's something that it shouldn't be prioritized. Thank you, Ms. Delatory. Um, Mr. Uh, Ms. Kim, did you want to respond? Oh. With regard to the last topic, it was not a petition to the agency, but rather a topic raised by a lawmaker. And that is one of the, that is why it was included in the chart. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Uh, Mr. Sabo, is there public comment on this agenda item? This is for agenda item seven, regulations, proposals, and priorities discussion. If you'd like to make a comment on agenda item seven at this time, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine. If you're joining us this afternoon by phone, your name will be called when it's your turn and you'll be invited to unmute yourself. Those dialing in by phone can press star six to unmute. You'll have three minutes to make your comment. This is for agenda item seven, regulations, proposals, and priorities discussion. Again, please use Zoom's raise hand feature or press star nine if you're joining by phone.
This is the last call for agenda item seven, public comment, regulations, proposals, and priorities discussion. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you so much, Mr. Sabo. I think I have a plan, um, and I will ask Mr. Cible, um to to after I uh, well, after I attempt this, I will ask Mr. Cible to please bless it or say try again, Chairperson Urban, and I will try again. Um, may I have a motion to authorize and direct staff to one. Proceed with developing rulemaking proposals on the following items. A, all the green items on the chart titled potential regulation proposals included in the materials for today's meeting. The blue items on the chart titled potential regulation proposals uh, included at, on that chart, excuse me. Um, and um, any others of yellow, orange, or red on the chart for the day, that is all the remaining items, uh, in staff's discretion, taking into account resources and timing questions um, in, according to staff's understanding, uh, as part of which the board would like the staff to take into account um, its preferences as discussed during the, the today's board meeting, but understanding staff have ultimate discretion on the timing and has authority to work on any of the items on the chart titled potential regulation proposals for today's meeting. And in addition to give staff discretion to package the items with existing rulemaking priorities or separately in a different rulemaking package, and to update the board on all the items during the next rulemaking priorities meeting, um, as well as uh, undertake any pre-rulemaking activities that would be helpful um, to staff developing the record or working on a rulemaking package. Good heavens, that was really long. Mr. Suble, does that work? That works. I think you covered everything that we discussed. Thank heaven we have transcripts. I'm happy to try again, um, but may I have a motion? If that's in line with what people think. Um, Mr. McTaggart, you were first and then Ms. De La Torre. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm happy to move that. I have one question though about what it covers um, about the green, because uh, just as I'm reviewing it, just so I understand one thing. Um, and so okay. if I could just ask Ms. Kim, 7013, include language that was previously held back to ease implementation, which is easy. When I look at the old 7813 from the previous iteration, there was a stricken language in E, old 7813, E for echo um, three, C around televisions and being able to encounter the language before, you know, while you're using it <clears throat> so you don't have to go searching around for it is that the part that's going to be is that what that is covering in that little 7013 that your notation about that yes that is uh we were going to revisit that language and include where we thought it made the most sense um taking into consideration some of the comments that we received during the comment period as well okay well and uh then i'm, I'm happy to uh, make the make the motion then Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. McTaggart. Ms. De La Torre? Uh, just quickly, I, I'm happy to make the motion again or support the motion. Uh, just for clarity, the general uh, request to look for opportunities to harmonize with other states and think about the drafting in terms of capitalizing the definitions and considering uh, processors and controllers is just not in the list, but it was in the conversation. I assume that we're including it in the motion as uh, something to prioritize. Um, is that correct? I think that is general enough. And I will ask Mr. Souble that we don't have to specifically state that. That can be part of our general guidance to staff as to how to exercise the authority we are delegating. Um, and I think everybody's in agreement that that's a good idea. Um, as we all know, my I, I really like 1799.199.40L. So um, I am certainly in agreement. Mr. Soublet, does that work? 
But yeah, I was going to be in agreement with that as well because you've given you've given staff the authority to exercise discretion with respect to that. So yes. Okay, I believe that I have a motion from Mr. McTaggart and a second from Ms. De La Torre. If the format, which was slightly unorthodox, works, Mr. Soublay. Yes. Sorry, you're on mute. I was muted. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Um, Mr. Sabo, would you please call the roll call vote? Yes, the motion as moved by board member McTaggart and seconded by board member De La Torre, that which was stated by the chair. Board member De La Torre? Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board member Lay? Aye. Lay, aye. Board member McTaggart? Aye. McTaggart, aye. Chair Urban? Aye. Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have four ayes and no noes. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. The motion carries with a vote of four to zero. Thank you very much to staff for carefully collecting all of these thoughts and, and, and keeping track of everything that was coming up during the rulemaking and putting this together for us so that we could discuss it. Thank you very much to the board um, for a thoughtful and careful discussion as ever. And thank you all for your patience. Uh, as I formulated one of the hairier motions that I've needed to formulate in this job. Um, I believe that we have now delegated to you, Ms. Kim, and the rest of the staff sufficient authority um, to move forward. Of course, if anything comes up, please don't hesitate to ask for an agenda item in our next meeting um, on that. Um, and thank you. And thank you. So thank you very much, Ms. Kim, and um, thanks to everybody. Let's move to agenda item number eight, where we will encounter the, the much discussed and much anticipated um, package uh, related to automated decision making and some other things uh, titled New uh, CPRA, which is California Privacy Rights Act Rules Subcommittee Update and Next Steps. The new CPRA Rules Subcommittee is uh, made up of Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay and they will be presenting this item. Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay, please go ahead. Oh wait, Mr. Taggart, do you have a, an interjection? Uh, um, yeah, I do, hold on a sec. Um, there we go, yes, sorry about this. Uh, so yeah, when do we bring up the items we'd like to add to the rule list? Just uh, let, hang on, let me check the agenda so that I don't say the wrong thing. It will be right after this agenda item. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay, please take it away. Uh, well, actually, we will be handing it off uh, to uh, Mr. Nelson Richards, and then you know I'll, I'll add on after um, he shares his presentation. Wonderful. Welcome, Mr. Nelson Richards, who is our assist, uh, Deputy Chief Counsel, um, if I have that right. Uh, Assistant Chief Counsel, yeah. Assistant Chief Counsel. I started, I started correctly and I ended incorrectly, so my apologies and congratulations on that promotion. Um, we are delighted to have you in the position. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Urban and members of the board. As the board is aware, on February 10th, 2023, the agency released an invitation for preliminary comments on proposed rulemaking on cybersecurity audits, risk assessments, and automated decision-making. The comment period is now closed. In response to the invitation, the agency received 57 comments totaling over 1,000 pages. The comments are posted on the agency's website and members of the public can review them by visiting the website and navigating to the page on preliminary rulemaking activities under the Laws and Regulations tab. Currently, staff are processing and reviewing the comments. They're continuing to research and review pertinent academic scholarship, public and private frameworks, standards, and reports, proposed legislation, and media reports. And they're using what they learn as they continue to draft the regulations. Looking ahead, the subcommittee and staff will identify key issues relating to cybersecurity audits, risk assessments, and automated decision-making technology for the board's discussion at a meeting this summer. We expect those key issues to include, for example, how the agency will define automated decision-making technology, 
and how it will define significant risk to consumers, privacy, or security for the regulations on risk assessment versus the regulations on cybersecurity audits. In light of the board's expressed interest on this rulemaking during prior meetings, this process will ensure that the full board will have input on key issues while the regulations are being drafted. And I'll conclude by noting that there's been particular interest among the public as well as legislators and other regulators about automated decision-making technology. Subcommittee and staff are continuing to monitor developments in this fast evolving area and welcome any feedback from other board members on that topic at this time. Thank you. I will. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add on uh, to Mr. Nelson Richards. Um, yeah, so, you know, the subcommittee has been hard at work. We, you know, developed quite a bit of, you know, structure to the regulations, but we, we felt that it would be best to let staff process uh, the comments that we got before presenting the threshold questions to the board. Um, I think, you know, we, we, saw, we saw the interest from the board in having uh, input on this, this topic, and I think how the board approaches these threshold questions will really impact the the regulations that the agency drafts. Uh, we, we chose this approach to make sure that staff doesn't get too deep into developing the regulations under the subcommittee's direction, only to find out that the full board uh, may not agree with that direction. So uh, we think this approach best balances, you know, agency resources, as well as being considerate of all of the input we've gotten from the public. Um, you know, I, I very much look forward to presenting um, these special questions to the board at our next board meeting or uh, at a board meeting in the summer. Um, so with that, you know, that will pretty much end my section of um, today's agenda item. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Just so I have it straight. So the, the thinking would be to, in our next board meeting, um, which on our calendar is, um, July, so the second Friday in July, and I don't, I don't anticipate that we would have one before the other week. We, we could have, you know, a legislative um, special meeting or something if something were to come up. But um, that at that point, um, the subcommittee would provide some materials for the board on the threshold questions and ask us to consider those carefully and have the discussion then. Yes, and then you know, it's essentially like there's different directions we can take as a board and as an agency on you know, how to define certain things or uh, how to define risks. So you know, before the, we get too deep into developing those regulations, entering the official rulemaking, we thought it would be best for the full board to have input on those threshold questions. Understood. Uh, so yes. Uh, yeah, and apologies for needing clarification. I think Are I'm you? covering from that motion. Um, Ms. De La Torre? I just quickly want to say that we do intend to bring those questions. I just don't want to commit to the next meeting necessarily. There might be a need for flexibility. That would be ideal, but let's not commit to the next meeting. We need to um, still work with the staff on how to best organize um, the presentation for the board. Okay, thank you. Understood, understood. I was I was trying to promise you the first possible, um, if that's what you wanted, but that that's understood. We will, I will wait for notification that it's time and put it on the agenda then. Um, other comments or questions? Mr. McTaggart? Um, this is a, uh, uh, um, I just, I would, I'd, I'd love to get a sense of the board whether we think it's appropriate to sort of, um, I guess it's an informal kind of a request, but to let the uh, leadership know that it would be okay to start portraying ourselves as, you know, the probably the only realistic AI regulator in North America, uh, or I should say, sorry, in the United States. Uh, don't offend the Canadians, but uh, or, or, or Mexico. But you know, I think that we are. There's so much press right now about AI, and there's people worried about it, and people think it's going to solve everything in the world. We are we are it for the foreseeable future in terms of you know uh, because of our mandate around automated decision making, which is after all is what AI is all about. So I, I just think we should be because uh, it's one more in my mind reason in Washington for them not to preempt us with a weak law. 
Um, and so uh, I don't really have a, I don't really have a, um, it's not a motion or anything, but I guess if any board member, I, I guess I would say feels like we shouldn't be sort of making noise about the fact that this is where the action is going to happen. Uh, maybe it would be useful for 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 the director to hear that, but uh, you know, because um, I personally, you know, would urge us to to take the baton and run with it, because um, I think this is likely to be where this incredibly important technology gets regulated in the United States uh, in the foreseeable future, and uh, and and it's a, a huge argument to make to Washington: just don't mess with California. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Mr. Lay. Yeah, and you know that's exactly, Mr. McTaggart. That's exactly why we're taking this approach. I think if if the agency uh, is, you know, and the full board is committed to a certain direction, um, and you know, taking a leadership role, it, it would take you know the full board's commitment. Uh, and I think that's why it is so important for us to have the full board's discussion around these threshold issues on how we should approach these regulations, and that'll allow staff to have, um, you know, more you know, direction on, you know, how, uh, how best to develop the, the regulations on AI and these impact assessments and these uh, automated, automated decision making. Thank you, Mr. Um, I, I wanted to, sorry, Ms. Delatory, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to second that, but um, just make a comment that um, obviously Colorado has finalized their rules. They do have rules on automated decision making. They do have rules on um, assessments. And I think that one of the important things is to think about harmonizing ourselves with other jurisdictions, including Colorado, we will have opportunities to have that conversation as a board. Um, I don't disagree with what has, said, has been said. And I think that this is one area where there's going to be need to revisit whatever package we put forward in a potentially not that long of a period of time based on the developments on the ground. I just didn't want to minimize the efforts and the, um, uh, you know, and, and the steps forward that Colorado has already taken. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, I, I appreciate that we'll have the opportunity to discuss the issues as a board, both to provide guidance, which of course I'm, is substantively most important, but to Mr. McTaggart's point, it, it allows us to offer our viewpoints um, on how to go about this um, in a timely manner um, in one of our public meetings. So thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lay, Ms. De La Torre, um, or Mr. Richards, is there um, anything further you would like to say about this before I ask for public comment? Wonderful. Um, Mr. Sabo, would you please um, check to see if anyone would like to make a public comment on this agenda item? This is for agenda item number eight. <laughs> uh, if you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raised hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. Your name will be called when it's your turn and you'll be invited to unmute yourself. Those dialing in by phone can press star six to unmute. You'll then have three minutes to make your comments. Again, this is for agenda item number eight, the new CPRA rules subcommittee update and next steps. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine on your phone. This is the last call for public comment on agenda item number eight, new CPRA rules subcommittee update and next steps. Again, please raise your hand using Zoom's raise hand feature by pressing star nine if you're joining us by phone today. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Thank you to the uh, new CPRA rules subcommittee. Um, I know we'll be eager um, to hear from you again when you're ready uh, and we'll look forward to that. We now turn to agenda item number 10, a discussion of future agenda items. Um, this is the place um, to offer items to be considered for future agendas in addition to the standing items we've already discussed under agenda item number four. Um, 
Accordingly, the regularized items as we discussed, we don't have to mention, although you're, you're welcome to um, if, if you would like. I have a running list that I've been keeping that I will um, go through just so you know that it's there and then open it up to comment um, so I can add to the list and staff can add to the list. Um, we have some strategic planning items coming up as needed per Ms. Chidambira's update in agenda item number three today. We will soon need to discuss some additional practices and procedures, for example, with regard to enforcement and staff will guide when it makes sense to talk about that. Um, I have the chief privacy auditor on my list, which um, Ms. De La Torre also mentioned today, the executive director review, although that's on the standard calendar. Um, Ms. De La Torre and I will have a rulemaking process subcommittee update. Um, we're not certain yet um, if it will be partially in the next meeting or in in September, but as a heads up to everybody, and as a reminder, um, we um, will um, have, have uh, bring to you guidance from the staff on the interaction of the CCPA with the insurance code and any recommendations we have on rulemaking process going forward. Um, thank you for your patience, and we'll, we're looking forward to talking with you about it when um, it's a good time to do so. Um, we will um, welcome uh, and um, approve California Children Data Protection Working Group appointees when those are ready. Um, my understanding is there's a sort of broad effort um, overall to organize that um, across the state. So that will come um, when it comes. Um, and so that is the list of everything except for the rulemaking topics that you wanna bring up in the public meeting rather than alerting staff separately. Um, and just as a reminder um, uh, to please mention those on your list if you have them, uh, as well as any other um, future agenda items. Um, with that, um, our, excuse me, are there future agenda items um, from any other board members? Uh, thank you, Mr. McTaggart, please go ahead. Great, okay, thank you. Um, all right, so um, I have a couple here. One, um, and I, I suppose I think this is mostly probably from for Ms. Kim. Um, is, is it Ms. Ms. Kim? If you're still here, would it be a, Would you mind um, coming back? I, I'm sure you're there and listening. Um, all right, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. McTaggart. Okay, so um, uh, I'm going to have a couple of references to stuff that was in the earlier regs. And then when we had that rainbow colored one, you know, we, we struck some and added some in, uh, some language uh, changed. And so the first, I have a first couple of ones about that. Um, in the old version of um, the regs, um, there was a concept around SPI that was, uh, was collected um, and uh, by businesses that didn't have an online presence. And uh, we struck, and this is the old 7014 uh, E for Echo 3. And um, the concept dropped out. And I'd like to get, get it back in the in the mix of things. So if you walk in to a store or something that doesn't necessarily have an online presence and it's collecting your SPI, how do you opt out? So just want to kind of flag that. That that the old 7013 um, E3 just dropped out. Um, and I didn't come back in. Then uh, my next one is we have this um, tension right now. There's a desire not to disclose businesses, not having to disclose the highly sensitive information. So in 7024D, currently the regulations just say that the businesses shall not disclose highly sensitive personal information. However, in, in um, 7023J, the right to correct, the businesses that the regulations say that the business must provide a way to confirm that the personal information it maintains is the same as what the consumer has provided. So under right to correct, I can go and I can say, hey, here's my social security number. Is that what you have? And they can say yes or no. Under right to know, I can go and I say, hey, what's my social security number? And they just say, we've collected it. That's all. And that's so in order to actually find out what they have, I kind of have to go and ask for a right to correct. And so I would just ask you to look at that because there is this kind of um, I have to make a right. I have to make a request to correct in order to actually find out 
what information you have on me. Um, and so I think that's a little absurd. I, there should be a way for me to figure out. Uh, uh, that was, that's actually included in the green topic of. Oh, is it? Okay. And I'll shut up. I'll team. shut up. Sorry. I apologize. No, it's not a problem, but I, I should have clarified that. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, well then maybe you'll stop me. The next one is the security and integrity um, issue. And that's one in, in, in the statute. Um, it's defined uh, as to help ensure you know, security integrity. Um, in the regulations, um, the preamble in 7027M2 is, is includes the word prevent and investigate, to prevent, detect, and investigate security incidents. And um, the words prevent and investigate are, are massive, I, I actually think are, are a huge diminution of the sort of limited um, carve out that that uh, security is given to say the right to delete, you know, why you can ignore a, re a request. And so I would, um, and I, as, as, as Director Sultani will, will recall in 2019, there was a law, AB 1416 that was proposed or a proposed law that was proposed that would have, would have uh, amended the statute that way. And, and many folks in the privacy community pushed back against this broadening of um of this carve out and so i i would like to go back to what's in the statute as opposed to including these two new words prevent and investigate and if i've missed something uh Ms. Um, Kim, so you know. yes uh this was in the yellow section of 7050 a4 stop, stop me next time i didn't see it so <laughs> I'm sorry. no i i because you know it, I, I realize it's um, described a bit broadly, but that's to look into whether we should revise the data security purposes for which service providers and contractors can use personal information. Okay, so so I think actually, um, um, Chair Urban, this actually underlines my previous point, which is that the the descriptors are so broad in the list of what Ms. Kim's putting together that they don't necessarily provide granularity to businesses going forward. So that's all I would suggest in the future is as we sort of flag some of these things we're working on, because I read that and I didn't even know that that was addressing the issue I, I cared about. Um, so, uh, so maybe on the list that we are working with a little bit more detail without staff having to research the whole thing. Okay. Right. Thank you. Now, uh, okay, so one, I just have a couple more Mr. Idea, Mr. concepts McHenry, here. Mr. McHenry, I apologize for stopping you for just a second. I just wanted sure. to thank Ms. De La Torre um, for her service today. I know that she needs to um, drop off of the meeting and we'll look forward to seeing her next time. Thanks so much, Ms. De La Torre. Thank you so much. Thank you. All, All right, Mr. McTaggart, right. thank you for the pause. Um, maybe, yeah, no start, problem. maybe start that one at the beginning. Yep. Thank you. So uh, the next one is, um, I'd love to request that staff study a regulation to require uh, that businesses um, include, that somehow the opt out, they'd study the, the, uh, the uh, implementation of an opt out that embraces what we're, we're all increasingly seeing the sort of reject all non-necessary cookies button. That's what people are kind of getting used to seeing. And um, so I'd love it, that, I mean, that might actually end up being the default uh, where we say when we're trying to opt out, if, you, if you're not doing it via your browser, if you're doing it, you know, um, one at a time. And I think our authority is um, under, you know, 185A194, which requires the business to see no more than three choices when setting a preference. And the, and the A194A requires the first option to be the most privacy, a one-click opt out from all sale or sharing. And so I guess all I'm saying is we kind of the statute said there should be a one click to opt out. That should be the first thing consumers see. Meanwhile, privacy forward businesses have kind of based on Europe, I think, mostly come up with this, you know, reject all non-necessary cookies. And I always like it when I see that. And I'm always annoyed when I have to go through and, you know, individually select each uh, category of cookie. So that's that's one um, request I'd have staff take a look at that. Um, the next one is that, uh, one of our, and this might, this might be in, 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 uh, uh, 
uh, Chair Urban, this might this might be, or, or, or Ms. Kim, this might already be in the model contracts or model one of the models, but just the notion of the regular uh, risk assessments that uh, the high risk processors have to fill out. Um, uh, is it feasible and is it a good idea to uh, have uh, the sort of a form that is standard where the CEO and the chief privacy officer of the business have to certify under oath that they've you know treated the information consistent with the law and consistent with their own representations about what they do with the data. Those two things I think would focus a lot of attention on making sure that the business is doing it because if the CEO and the, and the chief privacy officer have to you know certify under penalty of perjury that they've done this, uh, that will get the whole business working. Um, uh, uh, I think in a privacy forward way. And then my last um, uh, request would be granularity around deletion. If we could look at um, a requirement that I, as a consumer, could delete some of my data. And I'm thinking mostly around, you know, because right now businesses make it difficult. It's all or nothing. And so you think, well, I don't want to lose, you know, I've, 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 I've built a business on one of these social media platforms where I'm, I'm spending an awful lot of time on it. And what I really want to do is I want to delete my geolocation data. You know, you don't need to know where I was, but I want to keep other things. And right now there, we, we don't have that um, requirement. And I think something like that consumers would actually welcome as a sort of middle ground and not, because in a way the delete all or nothing kind of is a dark pattern. It's like, well, you're not going to delete all your data here because you still want to, you know, uh, have a presence. So I, I'd love to be able to say to Facebook, uh, actually, just delete my location. So those are my those are my other uh, that's my list of things. Thank you very much, Mr. McTaggart. And we can't discuss them in detail today, but um, Ms. Kim, you have those um, uh, written down. Wonderful, um, Mr. Lay or, or Mr. McTaggart. I am sorry. While well, we're with you, do you have any other um, potential future agenda items? All right. No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lay. Not to put you on the spot. I just want to be sure I don't um, miss you. OK, um, nothing from Mr. Lay. I have run through my list and I realized I usually update it during the conversation. Of course, there is a future agenda item for the new CPRA rules subcommittee um, when they're ready as well. Uh, at this time, Mr. Sabo, um, would you mind asking for public comments on this item? If the public has anything they would like to suggest, we would like to hear it. This is for agenda item 10, future agenda items. If you'd like to make a comment, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature, or by pressing star nine on your phone, your name will be called when it's your turn, and you'll then be invited to unmute yourself. Those dialing in by phone can press star six to unmute. You'll then have three minutes to make your comment. Again, this is for agenda item 10, future agenda items. Again, if you'd like to speak on the agenda item 10, future agenda items, please go ahead and raise your hand at this time using Zoom's raise hand feature or by pressing star nine if you're joining by phone. This is the final boarding call for agenda item 10, future agenda items. Madam Chair, I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, and thanks everybody um, for this discussion. With that, we will move to agenda item number 10. Oh, Mr. McTaggart, ooh, you're <laughs> under the wire. You're, you're, you're I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let I'm you really, in. I'm really sorry, I'm, I'm really sorry. Let, I'm gonna let you in, go for it. Sorry, sorry about this, Ms. Kim. I just went back and checked um, that, that one notification in your list of 70, 7050. And the one thing I just would highlight is I think that's restricted to the data, the, the prevent um, for, for, for uh, uh, service providers and contractors. And I actually think it should also apply to the business because also the business can say not delete. And I don't think it's appropriate for statute to have the, uh, the, the um, security exemption include prevent or investigate for the business as well. It's not just the service providers and the contractors. I think it's everybody. So noted, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. All right, I'm gonna pause for just a second, just in case. 
All right. Um, with that, we will move to agenda item number 10, adjournment. Um, I want to thank everyone, board members, staff, and members of the public for all your contributions to the meeting today and to the board's work, and everybody for working to make um, the meeting work and for us to be able to have our discussion about everything on the agenda, um, even though our schedule was a little bit um, wonky um, today. So thanks everyone very much um, for all of your work. Thanks especially to the staff um, who provided expert guidance and background for us today. It's been really wonderful and um, heartening to see what a terrific staff um, the agency has built um, and to benefit from your expertise. So thank you. And with that, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I so move. Thank you, Mr. Lay. May I have a second? I second. Thank you very much, Mr. McTaggart and Mr. Lay. I have a motion and a second um, uh, to adjourn the meeting. Mr. Sabo, would you please perform the roll call vote? Yes, the motion is to adjourn. Board Member De La Torre. Board Member Lay. Aye. Lay, aye. Board Member McTaggart. Aye. McTaggart, aye. Chair Urban. Aye. Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have three ayes and one not present. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, we have a quorum with three. Um, therefore, the motion has been approved by a vote of three to nothing. And this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is adjourned. Thank you all very much.